Hello, this is your host, Adam Graham, from Pretty Much the Present. And in this video, we'll be bringing you a compilation of old-time radio detective podcasts from 2010. The podcasts are appearing, for the most part, unedited, except for some extraneous or repetitive elements that are being removed because this is a compilation. As I said, these are old, so any websites or offers mentioned may not be valid at the time you're listening unless you find them on our website currently. Now, with that said, here is a week of Old Time Radio Detective podcast. <laughs> Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you this week's first episode, which is Box 13. Got any comments? Send them to me. Box 13 at greatdetectives.net. Please cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley. That's podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And uh, please remember our new Facebook group, facebook.greatdetectives.net. Well, exciting news. Um, the first uh, video test went perfectly, could not have been happier with the results, so we're ready for uh, the full scale, a full-blown uh, movie, um, and it will be Sherlock Holmes and the Secret Weapon. Now, this is one of four of the Rathbone Bruce uh, Sherlock Holmes movies that are in the public domain, uh, and it, it's a pretty interesting uh, movie. I think, you'll, I think you'll enjoy it. Uh, so that'll go out on Saturday. That'll be our uh, first monthly video. If we've got the um, uh, if we've got the app uh, uh, up and running by then, uh, if you purchase the app, you'll be able to hear my commentary. Um, but if not, it's still a it's still a pretty fun movie. So that'll be coming to you. Um, it's like I said, it's one of four, and we'll work on the other ones as opportunity arises. All right, well, um, before we get into today's show, I just want to encourage you, uh, if you plan on starting a business in the new year or a personal website or you want to expand or get another domain name, just remember to use the world's number one web host. That's one and one. Go to hosting.greatdetectives.net, uh, and you help support the great detectives of old time radio, and you also uh, get great deals on domain names. Uh, and all levels of internet service. So just remember hosting.greatdetectives.net. Well, this uh, this episode of Box 13 is called Double Right Cross. It's, of course, a boxing uh, episode, so it's time for Box 13 to come out of its corners, avoid the rabbit punches, and we'll get right into Double Right Cross. <laughs> Box 13, with the star of Paramount Pictures, Alan Ladd, as Dan Holliday. To Box 13, care of Star Times. Dear Dan, if this is the way you want it, okay. If a pal and buddy has to reach you the hard way, all right. Enclosed is a ticket to my fight with Brennan tomorrow night. I'd like to see your mug at ringside. If I don't, I'll make it a point to muscle up for you. If I don't, I'll make it a point to muss it up for you. Johnny Capelli. Johnny Capelli, a kid when I first met him, fighting in a different way. At Anzio. And maybe, just maybe, Anzio wasn't as hard for him to take as what happened right here. <laughs> Now, back to Box 13 and Dan Holliday's newest adventure, Double Right Cross. Johnny Capelli, contender for the middleweight crown, 
A big, overgrown kid with a smile full of white teeth and a heart full of kindness for everybody. Johnny Capelli? I never heard of him, Mr. Holliday. Well, you don't read the sport pages, Susie. But you know him, huh? Uh-huh. We played duck on a rock on the beach at Anzio for keeps. <laughs> I saw him a little while ago. Told him my box 13 idea, and I guess he saw the ad in the star time. And you're going to fight, huh? Yes, that's it, Susie. Did he send you a bedside seat? Uh, yeah. <laughs> There's nothing I can do with that one. So long, Susie. <laughs> driving rain, I headed for the stadium, and my cab ran fenders first into a traffic jam. Well, there was no use trying to get through, so I paid off the cabbie and started to plow the rest of the way to the stadium. I looked at my watch two minutes after ten. The first round of the fight was underway. By the time I hit ringside, people were already on their feet leaving, and there was booing and talk. Capelli knocked out. Capelli acted like a fourth rater. Johnny Capelli laid down. I pushed my way back to the dressing rooms so with a little knot of people around one door, and a girl was rattling the knob and calling. Johnny, Johnny, please open the door. Johnny. What's the matter? What's going on? Huh? Who are you? Report up, beat it. No, I'm a friend of Johnny's. Who are you? His manager. I mean, I was, but not after tonight. He loses one fight, and you're quitting. Yeah, like he did. When he comes out of there, tell him he can take this contract and tell him. You're Helen, aren't you? Yes. Please go away. Johnny can't see any reporters now. Please go, will you? I looked at him. So this was Helen. The girl Johnny dreamed about, talked about, raved about, and talked some more about. <laughs> All the while, he and I were trying to miss the casualty list in Italy. The girl he sent a diamond brooch, fought with a year's pay, he hoarded like a miser. Well, if looks counted, she was worth it. She rattled the knob again and... Please, Johnny, it's Helen. Johnny. May I try? Johnny! Johnny, this is Dan. Dan Holliday. Dan Holliday. Oh, yes, you recognize the name? Oh, yes, Johnny spoke of you. He said... <laughs> What's the matter with Johnny? He won't come out, Holliday. Oh, who are you? Helen's brother. You see if you can get Johnny out of there, Holliday. Johnny. Johnny. Johnny Capelli. It's Dan, Johnny. Is there any other way out of this dressing room? Yeah, the window. This is the ground floor. He could have got out of the window. Look, both of you, Helen and... Uh, Name's um, Eddie. Yeah, all right, Eddie. Get somebody with a key to open this door. Go ahead, Eddie. Step on it. Okay, be back in a minute. Now, what's all this about, Helen? Oh, I don't know. As soon as the fight was over, it came... He was conscious? Yes, he walked, but we got the door here, and he broke ahead of me and ran in and locked the door, and I just... All right, Helen. All right. Now, take it easy. We'll find out what's happened. When we got into the dressing room, Johnny was gone and Eddie was right. The window was open. I couldn't figure it. Johnny Capelli, a kid whose courage was A+. Plus. A kid who went through Anzio, Salerno, Casino. Sure, he was scared, like just like the rest of us. But he didn't whimper. And he didn't run out, ever. It just didn't figure, and Helen didn't make it any more clear. No, I don't know. I don't know why I ran away. Well, oh, take it easy, sis. Johnny must have had a reason. Yes, he must have. Now, listen, where'd he go? Well, if he's not at his hotel, I, I don't know. Well, he called there. That's no good. Any other place, think. Uh, I, I don't know of any. Uh, all right. Uh, where can I get in touch with you later? 387 Christopher Place. Good. You wait there. I'll find Johnny. <laughs> It was tough, but I finally tracked on a cab driver who remembered picking up a man back of the stadium. Seemed, well, drunk, he said. Took him to a little hotel on the other side of town. It could be Johnny, so I went there and... Go away. Johnny. Get out. Listen to me, Johnny. This is Dan. Dan Holliday. Dan? Yeah, let me in, Johnny. No, go away. Just go away, will you? What are you trying to do, Johnny? Nothing. Please, will you go away? Look, kid, let me in or I'll break in. Johnny. How you, Dan? Where's the light? Don't turn it on. Don't, Dan. Okay, Johnny. No light. Close the door. Why'd you come? 
Why do you think? Listen, nobody else knows where I am, do they? No, nobody. Helen? No. Where is she? Home, waiting waiting for me to call her. But you're not going to. What's the matter, Johnny? Dan, I... I'm sick. What do you mean? I don't know. Look, Dan, it was swell of you to come. There's nobody I'd want to see any more than you, but... Not now, Dan. Some other time, but not tonight. You're going to tell me what's wrong, Johnny. All right. Turn on the light and take a look. Johnny. Yeah. Better with the light off, isn't it? Now, listen, you took a beating. You're hurt, kid. Hurt badly. I've got to get a doctor. No. I said yes. No, you get a doctor and so help me, Dan. I'll kill you. I'll... Uh... Johnny. Hello. Desk clerk. Listen, get a doctor to room 10 right away. And that means right now. All right, Mr. Holliday. He'll sleep for a while now. How long before he wakes up, Doctor? Five, six hours, maybe longer. How badly is he hurt? Well, it's hard to tell. He took quite a beating. Uh, who is he? A uh, friend of mine. I see. Fight? Yeah, sort of. Well, I, uh... Look, Doctor, as long as there's no gunshot wound, you... You don't have to report this, do you? No, but... Uh... Well, let's leave it that way, then, huh? You'll be back in the morning? Yes. I'll make a more thorough examination, then. He was too hysterical to do much with tonight. But I think he'll be calmer when he awakens. Then there's nothing... Nothing too bad. I don't think so. Bruises, contusions, and his eyes. I, uh... What's wrong with his eyes? I'll see you in the morning. Uh, good night, Mr. Holliday. Good night. Thanks, Doctor. I sat by Johnny's bed and watched. I I didn't call Helen because, well, for some reason, Johnny didn't want anybody to know. To know what? Maybe I'd find out when Johnny came, too. Maybe he wouldn't tell me. But I just couldn't see Johnny running out on anything. There had to be something wrong. Something big. I sat in a chair alongside the bed and thought about it, and I guess I fell asleep because the next thing I knew, I... Huh? Oh, oh, just a minute. Good morning. Good morning, Doctor. Is he still sleeping? Uh, yeah. Hmm. Maybe for another hour or so. But I'll wait. Thanks. You'll be all right? Well, I'd like to ask him a few questions when he awakens. I don't think there's anything seriously wrong, but, uh... Well, I'll wait. What are you getting at? I don't know. You'll have to wait, too. Okay. Meanwhile, I'll go out and get some coffee. You can use some, too, can't you? Yes, thanks. I'll be right back. I thought I'd be right back. But when I got down to the street, something changed my plans... There was a newsstand, and the first thing that hit my eye was a sub-headline. It said, Boxing Commission holds up Capelli purse. Capelli disappears after fight fiasco. I hurried to a phone, called the Star Times, got a few strings pulled, and a half hour later, I was sitting across from the commissioner at his home. Just exactly what interest do you have in this, Mr. Holliday? I'm a friend of Johnny's. I see. All right, you must have something important to tell me. This early in the morning... I want you to tell me something, Commissioner. What? Why is the Commission holding up Johnny's purse? Because we believe the fight was not quite on the level. Meaning you think Johnny threw it? We don't know. We're going to look at the movies this morning. Johnny didn't throw that fight. Did you see it? No, I didn't, but then I... Then how do you know? Well, because I know Johnny. That's your only reason? I think it's enough, Commissioner. Look, Mr. Holliday... We have one job to do. Keep the boxing game fair and square as a service to the fans who pay their money to see good, clean sport. Capelli was a ten-to-one favorite last night. A big bet placed on Brennan would bring a lot of money to anyone. Meaning Johnny might have bet on Brennan? It's been done. And the commission is in business to see that it doesn't happen anymore. Until Capelli proves otherwise, we'll say he threw that fight. I didn't believe it. But Johnny lost. He lost badly. And he did run out, and he he wouldn't tell why. I went back to the little hotel and ran into the doctor who was just leaving. Oh, Mr. Holliday. 
That cup of coffee took a long time. It wasn't coffee. How's Johnny? He'll be all right. That all? No. Last night when I examined him, something puzzled me. What? His eyes. Pupils dilated. And? This morning when I examined him again, I asked a few questions. What about? Your friend had every symptom of bellamine poisoning. Last night, the pupils of his eyes were dilated and... Wait a minute, wait a minute. That would affect his sight, wouldn't it? Yes. Taken internally, bellamine is poisonous. Quarter grain and up is fatal. And less than that? Dryness of throat, nervousness. In other words, if someone gave him bellamine, he'd, he'd have a hard time seeing. Very difficult. And if he were a boxer? Well, if he were a boxer and went in the ring with his eyes in that condition, he wouldn't be able to see his opponent. <laughs> Back to Box 13 and Double Right Cross with Alan Ladd as Dan Holliday. So Johnny lost the fight because he couldn't see Brennan. But why did he run out? Why didn't he want anyone to see him? I, I thought I was going blind, Dan. Brennan was just a shadow that was beating me. Well, why didn't you quit? Why didn't you say something? Because Tom? I didn't want anybody to know. If it was going to be that way, I'd take it alone. Noble, huh? Look, Dan... I waited a long time for that fight. It meant a crack at the title. Helen waited with me. If I was going blind, I wasn't going to let her know. Stick with me. Sure, sure. A kid like you would think that way. Now listen to me, Johnny. Somebody fed you the stuff to impair your sight. Somebody who wanted you to lose that fight. Who? You're crazy, Dan. What did you eat yesterday? Eat? The day of the fight? Nothing. Just a little breakfast. And the rest of the day? Nothing. Liquids? Water? Milk? Of course not. No fighter fills himself up with liquids. Makes him logy, heavy on his feet. But, Johnny, the bellamine had to be given to you just before you went into the ring. Any earlier in the day, and the effect would have worn off before the fight. Look, why don't you lay off, Dan? I'm telling you, I, I didn't eat anything or drink anything, not for hours before the fight. But you had to. No, no, no. I know what I did. I Look, maybe it was my eyes. Maybe it is what I thought. I got hit in Italy, Dan. Maybe... It's not that... The doctor knows what he's talking about, Johnny. Somebody fed you that stuff. Who? You tell me. Nobody. I didn't eat, drink. Do I have to go over all that again? No. But I am. You wait here, Johnny. Johnny was a ten-to-one favorite over Brennan. And somebody played that for all it was worth. And it looked like it was worth a lot of money if the bet was big enough. A little while later, I was talking to Brennan. You're crazy, Holiday. Uh, maybe the guy wasn't in shape. Look, Brennan, Johnny was in condition. So you're telling me that somebody doped him? Meaning me? No, 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 I'm just asking. And I'm telling. I got 120 fights on a clean sheet. None of them was shady. I don't play that way. I'm not saying that. I'm only trying to find out who could have given Johnny that drug. Well, I wasn't near his dressing room. I didn't, didn't even see him after we weighed in that afternoon. All right, it, it had to be in his food. Food? No fighter's going to eat right before a match. A drink water? He just rinses his mouth, that's all. What else, Brennan? If he's training right, nothing else. But, but if he gets thirsty... I told you, he just rinses his mouth. He drinks water, it makes him heavy. That's why a fighter chews gum all day. It gives him a more... Gum? Fi- yeah, gum. Why? Gum. That's it, Brennan. That's it. <laughs> Sure, I chewed gum all day. Before the fight in your dressing room? I must have been chewing gum. I remember that... Go ahead, Johnny. What were you going to say? Nothing. Yes, you were. No, I wasn't. Look, there's only one way the drug could have been given to you. Now, you've got to think. Who gave you gum just before you went in that ring? I didn't have any. Johnny, what are you hiding? Nothing. You were going to say something a second ago. Did Baker, your manager, give you... No. Who else was with you? Just Baker. Where was Helen? Shut up, Dan. Did she give you any gum? Forget the whole thing. I'm going blind, that's all. Ah, oh, you're not. Beat it. Helen gave you that gum. She was in your dressing room before the fight, wasn't she? Cut it out, Dan. That's why you shut up before you remembered. And the chewing gum was the only way the drug could be given to you. Because you didn't eat, you didn't drink water or anything else before you went in that ring. But maybe 15 minutes before, Helen handed you the gum, didn't shut she? Shut up, Dan. Shut up and forget the whole thing. Come on, Johnny. She gave you the gum, didn't she? Didn't she? Didn't she? 
You, uh, you've still got a good right, Johnny. I'm sorry, Dan. Sure. Sure, let's forget it. But I didn't want to forget it. I left Johnny and went to see Baker's manager. I didn't tell him what I'd found out. I just listened. Sure, I brought the kid up from the ham and egg plums. But after last night, we washed up. Johnny was a ten-to-one favorite, wasn't yeah, he? Yeah, a match with the champ next. Did you bet on Johnny? I never bet. Even if you thought Johnny was going to win? What are you driving at? At somebody who stood to make a killing if Johnny lost. You're asking for a cloud holiday? I just had one. What about Helen? I want to bother her. All right, Baker, here are the cards. Johnny went in the ring last night, a sure bet to lose. What? Yeah, that's right. He was drugged. He couldn't see Brennan from the first bell until he was counted out. He was fighting on instinct and courage. Listen, what are you giving me? There was nobody in his dressing room but me and... And Helen? Yeah. Now, what about her? Nothing. Except once I walk in on the two of them and... Well, they was having a fight. What about? They clammed up when I walked in, but I heard something about a... Brooch. Brooch? Diamond brooch? The one Johnny sent her from Italy? Maybe. All I know is what I said. That's enough. Thanks, Baker. Maybe you'll have a champ on your hands yet. The next stop was to see Helen. I I wasn't sure how to handle this. And all I had to go on was the fact that Johnny was covering for her. Why? And they'd had a fight over that brooch. Again, why? So the big question was, did she or did she not double-cross Johnny? Her first words to me were... Dan, you found Johnny. Maybe. Maybe, but what do you mean? Sit down, Helen. What's the matter? Is he all right? He'll be all right. He's he's in a little hotel. Well, then take me there. I want to see him, Dan. Maybe he doesn't want to see you. What? Johnny, now... Did he say that? No. Well, what are you doing? Why don't you take me to him? Why talking like this, Dan? How much did you win on the fight, Helen? What do you mean? I watched her face closely after I asked that. Either she was the new Sarah Bernhardt or she was in the clear. For a couple of seconds, she stared at me and then... That's a filthy thing to say. Yes, I know, but I've got something to find out. And what did you hope to find out by asking me that? I hope to find out who made a killing on the fight by making Johnny a setup for Brennan. He was ten to one. Good odds for somebody who'd lay a good-sized bet on Brennan. You mean you... You think I'd bet against Johnny? Did you? That's not worth answering. All right, look. Johnny was knocked out because he was drugged. He couldn't see. And he was drugged only a few minutes before he went into the ring. Baker? No, a manager who's bringing up a champion doesn't sell him out. And and that leaves only me, is that it? Maybe. And I bet everything I had on Brennan. Is that your story? What's yours, Helen? I have none. If that's what you believe, believe it. But tell me where Johnny is. I promised I wouldn't. You promised? Oh, no. Johnny can't believe I... Where's that brooch he sent you? Brooch? Yeah, that's right. The one he sent from Italy. A $3,000 brooch that bring about 1500 in a pawn shop. And 1500 at 10 to 1. <laughs> well, seems to be my day for taking it. I'm sorry. Didn't you give Johnny chewing gum just before he went into the ring? What did you say? Chewing gum. Johnny wouldn't tell me, but I know you gave it to him. I... Yes. You... You admit it? Yes. Huh. That was the only way he could have been drugged. And you admit it? Yes, I admit it. Doesn't make sense. All right, it doesn't make sense. You're so right, Mr. Holliday. Nothing makes sense. Nothing. <laughs> Now go back and tell Johnny. Tell everybody. Go on. Well, this I couldn't get. Two of them. Johnny and Helen knowing it must have been the gum and Johnny not wanting to tell me. Then Helen coming right out and saying she gave it to him. Okay, there was one answer and I hunted for it in the shape of that brooch. I called Lieutenant Kling at headquarters and got him to do me a favor. It took almost the rest of the day, but late that afternoon. Brooch? Uh, yes, yes, the police called, but I, I assure you I did not receive stolen goods in my shop. The, the police know that I sure, don't... Sure, you're in the that... clear. Now, don't worry. Has the brooch been redeemed yet? Uh, no, no. 
Look, uh, all I want to see is a slip and who signed the brooch in. Well, here, I, I have it ready. I thought it would be the police who would come. I, it's right here. Here. Here you are. There's no mistake about this. Oh, no, no. I I let him have a thousand dollars on it. A thousand? And you're sure? Uh, yes, yes, yes. There. There's where he signed his name. Uh, John, uh, uh, John Capelli. No, that couldn't be right. Unless... Unless Johnny was afraid he couldn't make a fake fight look good. And wanted to make sure. But where did Helen figure? And why? Why? Then it hit me. Johnny protects Helen. Helen admits she did it. It made so little sense it began to clear. I checked with betting agents and found one who took a bet on Brennan, a bet of $1,000 at 10 to 1. He remembered who placed the bet, so... Well, they gave me one more call to make. Back, I went to Helen's apartment. Hello. Yes? Oh, hi, Holiday. Come on in. Oh, thanks, Eddie. Your sister home? No. Uh, grab a chair. Haven't you seen her? Oh, yes, yes, earlier. But aren't you going to ask me about Johnny? Oh, sure, sure. Uh, where is he? I know. Well, well, what about him? I mean, he's okay, huh? Yeah, yeah, he's okay. Oh, that's swell. You know, Holiday. I couldn't figure a guy like Johnny doing something like that. No, neither could I, Eddie. That's why I knew he didn't. What? Here, Eddie, uh, have a stick of gum. I... Oh, no, I, I never use it. Good for the nerves. Yeah, that's what they say. Well, that's what you come to see me about, huh? Maybe. You like to gamble, don't you, Eddie? Gamble? Oh, sometimes. Why? Ever get in so deep you had to... Uh... Steal to make yourself even? What kind of a crack is that? Oh, a nasty one. Just as nasty as stealing your sister's brooch. I... What did she tell you? Nothing. She had a fight with Johnny. Maybe he noticed she didn't have the brooch. Asked her about it. Maybe she had her ideas about where it was. Yeah? So what? So she knew and gave you a break. But you had different ideas, Eddie. You pawned the brooch, signed Johnny's name to the slip, then bet a thousand against Johnny. Ah, you nut, you're off your rocker. Tell you what, Eddie. Let's you and I take a trip to the pawnbroker, then we'll go to the betting agent where you placed the bet. Maybe I won't look so much off my rocker then, huh? All right. So what? I got a break. I'll redeem the brooch and... But what are you looking at me like that for? I took two on the chin today. Maybe it's my turn now to give, Eddie. You lay off now. Sis won't prosecute, and Johnny won't neither. <laughs> she won't marry him if he did, and... It's not the brooch, Eddie. It's the chewing gum. The gum you gave your sister to give Johnny. The drug gum to ensure your bet. You can't prove nothing, you can't. Eddie, you and I are going to the boxing commission, and you're going to talk. No, I ain't. Either that or I tell Johnny everything. And leave him in the room. Alone with you. Oh, uh, Eddie. Get your top coat, too. Kind of chilly outside. Well, Susie, as they say in the books, all's well that ends well. Gee, it's so romantic. Johnny and Helen getting married. Johnny getting another crack at the championship. And I... Oh. What's the matter? What's the matter, Mr. Holliday? Oh, Susie, my jaw is really sore. Johnny hung a nice right cross on me. What's a right cross? Huh? Well, it's, um... Uh, here, look, put up your hands. This way? Yeah. Mm -hmm. huh? Now, look, I, uh, I leave it my left like this, and you... Like that? <coughs> I... Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Holliday. Mr. Holliday, I... Oh... Good night, Mr. Holiday. Next week, same time, Alan Ladd stars as Dan Holiday in Box 13. Alan Ladd appears through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures. Watch for him in his latest picture, Saigon. 
Box 13 is directed by Richard Sandville with an original story by E. Jack Newman and Russell Hughes. Original music is composed and conducted by Rudy Schrager. Susie is played by Sylvia Picker, and the part of Johnny Capelli was played by John Beal. Production is supervised by Vern Carstensen. This is a Mayfair production from Hollywood. Welcome back. Um, I don't think I've seen a detective knocked out by the secretary before. That was a first. Um, but a, a very good episode, and with the writing, um, E. Jack Newman, we heard that name in the credits. E. Jack Newman is uh, one of the big uh, writers of old-time radio detective stories. He wrote scripts for uh, Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, Sam Spade, Richard Diamond, Jeff Regan, Investigator. Um, so the, this, is, this is a guy who really uh, contributed to the canon of so many shows. And I think, as I mentioned on a previous show, it's the consistency of these uh, same writers writing for different shows that is why you, we have so many really good shows out there. Uh, this one had a lot of interesting facts about boxing. Um, those who have been in it more recently... Uh, may be able to attest to if the training methods have changed any. Um, even with Rocky's training method, methods, I, I've, I've seen uh, at least parts of uh, the first five Rocky movies and never got the idea that it was that strenuous. Um, but anyway, another fun uh, episode, nice, uh, nice uh, episode from Dan Holiday. All right, well, before we run, we got a comment from our Facebook page, and we'll go ahead and share that. Jocelyn Ramirez writes in, Hi, Adam, I have listened to your podcast for a long time now, and I would like to thank you for all of your spent time and effort in creating your podcast. I love old radio and have been listening to them since I was 13 years old. Every night from 11 p.m. to 1 a.m., I would listen to them without fail. I definitely contribute my oversized imagination to the old-time radio shows, and I can honestly say that I prefer good old crackly sounding radio show over TV any day. Thank you for your podcast. I now can download them and take them with me wherever I go. This is great because I can't fall asleep without my radio shows playing softly from my nightstand. Seriously, thankfully, uh, uh, yours, Jocelyn, uh, uh, your number one fan. Well, thank you so much for that kind note, Jocelyn. And I encourage everybody to uh, join our Facebook group. That's facebook.greatdetectives.net. This is your host, Adam Graham, uh, bringing you today's episode of Pat Novak for Hire. If you've got any comments on the show, feel free to email me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Please cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Please remember our listener survey, survey.greatdetectives.net. All right, well, we've got a couple news items. I'm going to let you know brief, and then we'll go somewhat in-depth. First of all, uh, we're going to talk a little bit more about the movie feature, and some of the movies that we can do, some of those we can't. They're pretty limited um, by those that are in the public domain. Uh, and then uh, a little bit about the app and what the big benefits of that are. All right, well, first of all... Um, when we uh, do the mov uh, movies, uh, we want to be sure that those that we do are public domain. Uh, unfortunately, what that means is most of the greatest uh, detective movies um, are simply not available to us. If the film was uh, made after 1923, uh, generally... Um, it's under copyright, a film or television show. There are many exceptions, uh, and this happened when the studios forgot to renew their copyrights. And uh, basically, any film made after 1964 that was originally copyrighted uh, and had the appropriate notice on it uh, basically uh, is not in the public domain. The government automatically renewed every copyright that was made after 1964 uh, to the term of 95 years. Um, 
so basically those are those are kind of the limits we we face here so can't play the movie the Maltese Falcon uh, can't play the movie the big sleep um, so those uh, but there are plenty that did make it into the public domain but we'll kind of stretch a little bit on some of them uh, we'll throw in some that are kind of detective comedies some that are uh, some that are a, a few that are are maybe more myst mysteries than uh, detective stories as long as they've got a, a a strong character that we care about we're not just well uh, yeah we we'll 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 try and keep it though in the mystery detective realm um, and now on to the app well what can I tell you about the app the app, first of all, they've got this fantastic artistic rendering of Humphrey Bogart on the app. Um, really, really looks great. Um, and uh, with the app, well, the big things that it does is, number one, there are some extras that I throw in on the app uh, that you won't get just listening to the main podcast. Uh, the, the main one is that uh, on the on the uh, app, uh, one of the extra episode level extras you get uh, is you get my commentary on the uh, on uh, videos that are played, and then we also will throw in some uh, we'll, we'll throw in some extra, uh, extras generally each month with um, the actors who played some of our great detectives in some of their different roles. So if you're like, I'd like to listen to a little more Alan Ladd, or I'd like to listen to a little more uh, Basil Rathbone uh, outside of the detective realm, uh, we're going to throw that uh, throw in generally one of those a month. The first one we're going to do will actually be this Thursday. Uh, so February's will feature Basil Rathbone in one of his uh, more typical roles, uh, that he got in Hollywood. It's going to be uh, his role as a French pirate in Captain Blood. He doesn't star in uh, Captain Blood, but uh, you can you can take a listen, get a little extra, uh, al uh, get a little extra Basil Rathbone, and get some swashbuckling fun. So uh, that and one of my favorite features is the ability to star uh, the sh uh, a show. Uh, this p uh, puts a bookmark on it. So that you can be able to actually um, mark the shows that you just really, really like, and you'd like to hear again. Uh, so you just uh, you just go ahead and you hit the star, and uh, it'll be there. And that's helpful with this show uh, because if you think you know, I really like that Box Thirteen episode from eight weeks ago, or. I want something I can tell my boss. Let me listen to the Pat Novak episode. Warning, not uh, responsible for termination of employment um, resulting from using lines from Pat Novak on your boss. But um, you can basically, uh, on the left-hand side, you just hit the star button, and you want to go back to that episode You know, a month or two from now, you just hit the, uh, hit the star button along the bottom, and it will show those episodes that you have favorited, bookmarked, so you can go back to, to them without scrolling. So, uh, it, And this works for the iPhone as well as the iPod Touch. does require a Wi-Fi connection if you've got the iPod Touch. So check that out, app.greatdetectives.net. Since that was a bit of an advertisement there, just explaining all that, I won't go into a whole lot on uh, Johnny Dollar Air. Just remember, johnnydollarair.com for your uh, travel needs. Uh, and support uh, old time radio uh, as well, um, but we're going to get into today's episode of Pat Novak for Hire. Uh, this one is called Agnes Bolton, and I should be clear that there is a missing episode between last week uh, last week's episode we played and this one. Um, the somewhat good news is that missing episode is actually uh, in existence. It's sort of. Uh, the episode itself is gone, but you can find the script uh, to, the to the episode, Lola Madden, and uh, you can read it. 
Uh, it's pretty standard patent, all that stuff. I've cut, uh, but you got the whole script uh, that's available, except for Pat Novak's summation. Uh, but actual performance isn't out there, and I'm not even aware of like an amateur theater group that's uh, performed it and released it. Uh, but you can go and read the script. Just put Pat Novak, Lola Madden in, and search, and you can pull it up and uh, read it. Uh, Dennis has got the script over at digitaldeliftp.com. Um, so, today's episode, of course, Agnes Bolton, and I want to tell you something very important, and it doesn't sound important right now, but it'll all make sense in just a couple minutes. Dean Acheson was Harry Truman's Secretary of State. Got that? Good. All right, let's get into Pat Novak for Hire, Agnes Bolton. Pat Novak for Hire. The sign out in front of my office says, Pat Novak for hire. It's about the only way to make a living down on the waterfront in San Francisco. Because around here, a set of morals won't cause any more stir than Mother's Day in an orphanage. Maybe that's not good, but that's the way it is. And it wouldn't do any good to build a church down here. Because some guy would muscle in and start cutting the wine with wood alcohol. All you can do is try to make the books balance. And the easiest way to do that is keep one hand on your billfold and... The other hand, on somebody else's. Oh, I rent boats and do anything else that'll buy a warm winter. Works out all right. It saves the government a lot of money. But if anything goes wrong, your trouble comes hard. It doesn't do any good to sing the blues, because down here, you're just another guy in the chorus. I found that out Wednesday afternoon. It started to rain up by Pier 19, and I knew there was a storm on the way. The bay looked flat and smoothed over. But you can say that for a lot of quarrels. So I closed the office and walked down to the barber shop for a shave. The barber lathered me up so I couldn't answer back and started to tell me how Dean Atchison ought to handle things. About five minutes later, somebody walked into the shop and started to tap on my foot. He got tired of that and moved up to my chest. Hey, you listening? Hey, stop pushing. That's my chest, not a buzzer. Are you listening? Yeah. What's on your mind? Hey, I want to talk to you alone. He's a barber. He won't listen. Let's go alone. All right, let's go. I'll be back in a minute. How do you like that? I got a 14 across to my wife. He says that... I want to hire you tonight. Will you do something for me? Not for friendship. I give you $200 to follow a woman. I've done it for less. Not this kind. Her name is Agnes Bolton. You'll find her at 7 o'clock tonight down at this bowling alley. Here's the card. Mm -hmm. Address is there. How do I spot her? Read it off an ankle bracelet? You won't have any trouble. She's a large woman about 50 years old with a reddish face. Oh, that's no help. For 50, she sounds normal. Not Agnes. She couldn't pass for 90. She'll be playing in the last alley with a woman's team called the Playmores. Yeah. You'll follow her out of the bowling alley. Somewhere along the line, she'll pick up a green leather bag. After that, I need your help. It doesn't sound like love. She'll go to the Yacht Harbor. Get aboard a boat called Seventh Heaven. I want you to have your boat ready and follow her into the bay. She'll leave that bag aboard some ship. I want to know the name of it. Now, is that $200 worth? Yes. I'll wait for you in your office. Contact me there and be careful. Is she that tough? No, but her friends are. With a figure like that, how come she's got any? They're holdovers. Now, just be careful. Yeah. Well, it sounds easy at these prices. That depends on your luck, Mr. Novak. If it turns bad, you've been cheating. He stood at the door for a minute and his eyes swept the shop like a $10 broom. And then he turned around and walked off. Well, you couldn't tell anything from his face and his smile was as smooth as a pound of liver and a bucket of glycerin. Well, after I finished, I went down up here 19 and I took the boat up to the yacht harbor. I tied up near the seventh heaven and I started downtown to that bowling alley. It was ladies' night. And I stood against the back rail and watched the women bowl. Most of them were wearing slacks, and 
I ever get a few bucks ahead, I know the right business. At least the demand is there. About ten minutes after I got there, Agnes Bolton showed up, and I knew right away Max Hunter overrated her. She was at least 50, because you can't get that ugly without years of practice. She was wearing a green woolen dress, and her figure wasn't any worse than a bale of cotton somebody's cut the wire on. The fat hung down from her arms, and there was so much of it you knew even her bones were plump. And Max was right about her complexion. It was red and scratchy as if she used a bag of sand for cold cream. Well, I must have stood there about ten minutes watching him bowl when the other girl came up. I didn't see her, but I felt her as she brushed up against me from behind. She leaned on the railing close to me, and when she started to talk, it was like grafting a hot iron onto your spine. You look sad, Mr. Novak. Is it the view? What are you, the repair squad? No. I want you to do me a favor. You do me one. Hmm? Slide over. I bruise easy. Oh? No, what's on your mind? I want you to do me a favor. Don't follow Agnes Bolton. You're pretty, but I got Max Hunter's dough. I'll help you spend it. Don't let Agnes Bolton get to that boat. Look, Angel, go warm up an armory. I got a deal. Suppose I tell Agnes Bolton you're going to follow her. You tell her first without tagging by here. Now, if you got something on your mind, lay it on the line or relax. I want her worse than Max Hunter does. When she gets that green bag, I want you to bring her to me. I couldn't move her that far. You better rent a derrick. Please, Mr. Novak. It's important to me. I want to talk to Agnes Bolton. I can give you more money than Max Hunter. You haven't got enough to cover, lady. You're talking about kidnapping, and that's a federal rap. The answer's no. You're sure? Unless you want to change the offer. I hope you make it, darling. I may. Don't bet you $200. It's bad to die broke. Is anybody that tough? Now it's my turn to brush you off. Go ahead and follow her, Mr. Novak. But I'll bet you have to roll her the last couple of miles. Hmm? And unless you can prove it's an election bet, the police will cause you trouble. <laughs> watched her as she turned her back and walked out of there. She looked real good. She was wearing a tight jersey dress that gave you the idea she either thought the weather was warm or she wasn't much on details. Well, I turned around and looked for Agnes Bolton. The game was breaking up and she started into the dressing room. A few minutes later, she came out and started down Market Street. There was no trouble following her. You could see her in the crowd and she rolled from side to side as she walked, and when she bumped into anybody, they looked back at her as if they'd been hit in the chest with a sack of jelly. She crossed the street at Stockton, went into a little coin shop. She came out about five minutes later with a green leather bag. She strapped it over her shoulder, and she held onto her purse with the other hand. At Powell Street, she got on the cable car up near the front. I moved up there to be safe. She looked heavy enough to tip a cable car uphill. In that light, she didn't look any better. Part of her hair had come undone and hung down in her face like the branches on a dead tree. I noticed her eyes for the first time. They were small and so close together they could have saved time and put them in one socket. Well, she got off the cable car at Geary and walked into a hotel. I followed her and watched her squeeze into a telephone booth on the other side of the lobby. The way she fit, a sardine ought to be happy. She took some money out of her purse and started to dial. A couple of people moved in front of her, and I didn't get a look at her for about five minutes. And when they moved away, she was still talking to somebody. I looked up about ten minutes later, and I knew something was wrong. Her head was pressed against the phone. She'd run out of conversation. I walked across the lobby and opened the door to get to the phone booth. She fell out as old as she'd ever get. There, hey, help me get over to the couch, will you? Yes, sir. Was she your wife? Well, if she was, this is the way I'd want her. Her purse is spilled all over the floor. Sure is a mess. Yeah. She's some relative, huh? Look, mister, stop trying to pair us up. I was around when she tumbled out, that's all. Yeah. What'd she die from? I don't know. I just figured you might know what she died from. No, I don't. That's a simple question to answer when you know what all she right, died from. Let me through here. Come on. All right, stand back. Give her air. She can't use any more, copper. Huh? She quit about five minutes ago. Who are you? I'm not dead. She is. Then who's she? You better check on her stuff. And don't forget that green bag. Yeah. I... What bag? The green bag over there on the floor. Well, it was over there a minute ago. The same one the little guy had? What little guy? The one who was talking to you. He just walked out of here carrying a green bag. Well, I got out on the street, and the little man had just crossed Geary. He turned and looked back once, and I saw him melt into the crowd and disappear quick like the wake of a ship on a dark night. When I came back to the lobby, 
The copper was over to the couch, making noises in his throat as if he was trying to eat a pound of cellophane. The manager of the hotel was wringing his hands and making little steps like a ballet dancer with a hot foot. The copper took my name, put in a call to homicide, and a few minutes later, I got into that phone booth. There was a number on the pad, and I took it down. It was Greystone 42961. Well, it didn't prove much, but Agnes Bolton wasn't out to prove much tonight. I began going through the phone book, but there was no Max Hunter listed, and when I called the office, nobody answered. I knew there was as much chance of him showing up as a second piece of butter on a 50-cent lunch. I ran down that Greystone number and found out it was an address out on Post Street. I walked through the lobby and out the side door. Some of the people were out of the dining room, and they looked mad because Agnes Bolton had died during the roast beef instead of later. Well, I walked down Geary to the Union Square garage and gave the guy my ticket. He started down the ramp for the car, and I stood there waiting. I must have looked lonely, because Hellman from Homicide shoved up near the cashier's cage and started over. He made his way through the cars, and as he squeezed by the last one, he looked like a sea lion. Hello, Novak. We identified her. Well, you had lots to work with, Hellman. Where are you going? Out on Post Street. I'll go with you. Her name was Agnes Bolton. You read it somewhere? She was a government agent. They got their money's worth. Coroner says she died of quick poison. How quick? Five minutes. You're working him too hard, Hellman. He's got a license. He says five minutes. She was in that phone booth ten minutes. Nobody got to her. She looked dead to me, Novak. I don't believe you. Well, I'm hurt. I don't believe a thing you say. That's up to you. I'm not starting a religion, Hellman. I watched her for ten minutes. Nobody got to her. You better check on that little guy. Yeah? She was carrying a green bag. A little guy walked out of there with He sounds hard to find. You don't. Hey, mister, is this your ticket? Yeah, it's a blue nag. Hey, you better come down and drive it up. Why? I can't get to the wheel. The guy on there won't move. Huh? I don't blame him either. When you're dead, you got a right to rest. <laughs> Hellman stood there a minute, wiping his teeth with his tongue, and it began to sound like somebody beating the bathtub with a piece of steak. When he finished making noises, we walked down the ramp to the car. It was the little guy who had taken the green bag. He was hunched over, and he was grabbing the wheel as if he'd just married it. Hellman lifted his head up and laid him across the seat. The light was bad, but you could see a little of his face. It was watering around his forehead, and the damp hair was plastered down under his hat brim. The perspiration had broken up and started to run down his forehead like tears, and you got the idea he cried out of his hairline instead of his eyes. He didn't look surprised or pained. He just stared with a puzzled look as if he'd missed part of the conversation. Hellman stood there trying to wipe some egg off his coat and turning to look at the guy to make sure he didn't leave. So what happened, Novak? So he had an automobile accident, Hellman. I don't know. He's your passenger? He bummed the ride himself. When I saw him, he was on his way with that green bag. Where is it? He got talked out of it. You better check on a guy named Max Hunter. Uh, whose cousin is he? He gave me 200 bucks to tail Agnes Bolton. I got another offer, too. Yeah. A blonde biscuit, and she said everything on the beat. So a total stranger. You sure met a lot of people. You better meet a lot of them, too, Hellman, because one of them got to Agnes Bolton. Well, how about Junior here? Did he crawl down the ramp and die on your seat covers? I don't know how he got here. Well, maybe you left him here and forgot. No, he wouldn't slip my mind. I haven't murdered anybody in the front seat. Well, that is lively, though. You better get a story, Novak. You already got mine, Hellman. You won't like the ending. No, but I'll bet you do. I like it fine, Novak. You're the only lead on Agnes Bolton. I'll shop around and get enough to pin you down. You couldn't pin down a dead butterfly, Hellman. You better look up Max Hunter and check on a boat called the Seventh Heaven. I will, and I'll put a tail on you, Novak. Follow you all over San Francisco. He'll go any place. That's fine, because I got a suggestion. As soon as Hellman left, I took a cab out to that address on Post Street, but it was a waste of time. I might as well have been peddling tip sheets in a monastery. There was a brown house on the corner, and there was a big curved window that stuck out from the rest of the house like a wart on the back of your neck. A toothy old man answered the door and said he didn't know Agnes Bolton. I was pretty sure he was on the level. He just kept nodding his head and rubbing the wrinkles on his face. There were enough of them there to bundle up and sell as a canal. I left though downtown again. On the way, I went by the yacht harbor, and the seventh heaven had moved out into the stream. Well, it was raining harder now, and the docks looked shiny as if somebody had given them a coat of egg white. Well, I had a couple of places to hit, so I looked up Jocko Madigan. He's a good guy who never learned that if you keep your foot on a bar rail for 20 years, it'll do more good for your arches than it will for your brain. I finally found him in the hunt room of the Bellevue Hotel. Oh, gee. 
A drink for Mr. Novak. Uh, something to take off the chill. No, I don't want a drink, Jocko, and you've had enough, too. I refuse to shiver to death, Patsy. I'd look terrible with a blue face. Will you stop drinking, Jocko? I hate whiskey, Patsy, but I'm drinking tonight with a purpose. I made a deal with Charlie the bartender to buy every eighth drink, and I got him on the run. By morning, I'll have him in bankruptcy court. Look, Jocko, I'm in trouble. I always know when I've had enough to drink, Patsy. When I tilt the glass up, the rim rubs against the bridge of my nose. It's a sort of safeguard so that when my nose begins to break out in blisters, I know I've had enough for the night. Will you listen? Patsy, you sound like a young girl coming home from boarding school. You'll never be on the right side of things. You'll always be in trouble because you're a bad citizen. You're a shabby half-step in the march of progress. All right, Jocko. You don't know the difference between good and evil. For you, all of human endeavor is a vague blur in high heels. And your vocabulary is a few gutter terms sandwiched in between yes and no. You'll never be any good, Patsy. Yeah, yeah. You might as well try to recapture melancholy or ventilate a swamp. You haven't a chance, Patsy. You'll never be any good. Are you all through, Jocko? Yes, if you're going to be touchy. Hellman wants me on a murder rap. Yes? Some tubby woman died in a hotel lobby. Sounds like his mother. She was a government agent. I followed her in there. Patsy, you've got to start trusting the government. I was paid to follow her, but she ate some poison somewhere along the line. Ah, uh, that's the trouble with food. I got hired by a guy named Max Hunter. Look him up and resign. That's the best way out of this thing. I don't know where to find him. And I think that Max Hunter's a phony. Oh, you've got to help me. Yeah? Now, he gave me this card. His prints must be on it. Check it down at headquarters, will you? Find out if he's got a record and then tag by my place. Yes, uh, I'd better have a drink first. There's an ugly taste in my mouth. I, uh, I think it's saliva. Will you hurry up, Jocko? All you do is drink. That's all I have left, Patsy. I'm too young to die and too old to do almost anything else. Yeah, sure. It's true, Patsy. When you get to be my age, most of the quiet pleasures are fattening, and most of the active ones would kill me. Good night, lover. <laughs> When I left Jocko, I dropped by the Chronicle morgue to look up Max Hunter. There was nothing under Hunter. I looked through every Max from Bear back to Beerbum, and I couldn't find a thing. Well, it was close to 11 when I rode down to the office for a final check. It wasn't raining hard anymore. It was a nice, easy drizzle, and you could hear it playing against the sheds along Pier 19. It sounded quiet, almost private, like the sound a woman makes when she runs her fingernail up and down her stocking. It got on your nerves at first, and then you began to enjoy it. The minute I got to the door, I knew something was wrong. There wasn't any reason, but I got the feeling. The same way you know sometimes when you're going to get the busy signal on the phone. I could see her lying there on the floor before I turned on the light. You took one look at her, and you knew she was the sort of girl whose name ought to be Pearl or Myrtle. Somebody would sapped her, and she was lying with one hand stretched out and the other under her hair. It wasn't really hair. It looked more like a pelt or a raccoon just after a shampoo. It was fuzzed up on the sides, and on top she'd combed it back so tight it was about to go under the scalp. She began to move a little. When I bent over, she started to mumble. What do you want? The red, if you're going to stay long. Here, put your head up. Are you Mr. Novak? It's too late to change. Where's Agnes Bolton? Where'd she go, Mr. Novak? I don't know where she went. Was she a good girl? Something's happened to her. Don't worry, it won't happen again. Who sent you here, Max Hunter? Yeah. Please help me out. All right, come on. I'm Francine Kane. I came to find out about Agnes Bolton. You're a deep sleeper. What happened? You wouldn't know her. I would if she's a tall blonde on the make for that green bag. Who is she? Joan Haywood. You can find her at the Geary Theater. Is she an actress? Not exactly. Yeah. Her stray talents, Mr. Novak, are dimensional rather than dramatic. If you're smart, you'll stay away from her. Don't tell him anymore, Fran. He's paid up. Hello, Hunter. You oversold me. You give me back the 200. I'm going to give you lots for your money. Don't include Agnes Bolton. I don't know anything about her. Is that a lie? Might be. There's a green bag. Joan Hayward has it. Is that a lie? The little guy didn't think so. She left him dead in my car. Let's go, Fran. No, you're in a hurry, Mac. You're not. I hope you like your office, Novak. Huh? Because this is where you're going to spend the night. <laughs> Don't let him feel bad, lady. It must have been his turn. When I left, he was crumpled up against the desk and she was staring down at him as if she forgot to water the plants. 
When I rode by the Geary Theater, it was dark, so I looked up Joan Hayward's address. When I got out to her place, I knew I'd made a mistake. The landlady clutched her bathrobe like a bar of solid gold and told me Joan Hayward left the house ten minutes ago. There was a cabbie at the corner, and he said he dropped her at the gold bar club a few minutes before. I got down there about one o'clock, and Hellman was wandering around, stopping every few feet as if he expected to hear something. The bar was dark except for a light over on one side, and over near the jukebox, Joan Hayward was stretched out as dead as a deer on a fender. At first, Hellman didn't pay any attention when I walked in. I stood there for a while and looked at Joan Hayward. She still looked pretty, except in the dim light her skin looked coarse and reminded you of a piece of felt that was almost worn out. But the rest was all right, and Hellman came over for another look. What did you forget, Novak? My black tie. How'd it happen? The bar was closed. Where were you? Crawling out from under your thumb. Yeah. We're going to keep that coroner. It was quick poison. Yeah. We found a needle in her coin purse. She didn't know about it and ran into trouble when she started to call up. You better find this guy, Max Hunter. That's going to be hard. Yeah? There is no Max Hunter. Does she believe that? Your shaker friend came in with a card. We went over the fingerprints. They belong to Jackie Wren. He's wanted for espionage. For more than that now, Hellman. Maybe. Where have you been? Look, Hellman, stop needling me. I won't go on the block for her. Don't you like her? I got an alibi you can't break. I've been all over town. Ask your tale. Ask your tale where I've been. That won't get it. Huh? He reported in at 11.30. You got the wrong idea, Novak. You don't raid overtime. <laughs> When I left there, I knew everything was downhill. Hellman could stick me for everything but Dan McGrew. My only out was to find Jackie Wren, but you can't ring that many doorbells in one night. I went through the book, but there was no Jackie Wren or Max Hunter listed. I went home to get some sleep, and if they turned Gabriel loose tonight, that was all right with me. Jocko called up about nine and said there was still no trace of Wren. Well, some mornings you can't trust yourself with a razor, so... I got dressed and went down to a Greek's on Geary Street for breakfast. The murder was all over page one, but there were so many pictures of Hellman, you couldn't tell who was dead. I was about halfway through breakfast when I noticed a story down in the corner. A girl named Tony Pritchard had been found dead out in the marina. The story said everybody liked her. The police didn't have a lead, and they couldn't find a reason. It seemed kind of funny, but when I got to the last paragraph, I began to wonder... It said she was employed by the Musatone Company and worked the late shift as a switchboard operator. I wasn't sure, but you can't pass the dice when you only got a buck left, so I jumped down to see Frank Lupo. He said the Musatone Company owned the jukebox in the gold bar club, and that it worked like all the rest. People use a little microphone in front of the box. They call into a main switchboard for songs. I grabbed Jocko, and we got up to the Musatone Company. The guy in charge said, sure. They recorded some of the talk just to check on the girls, and sometimes the girls did it just for laughs. Well, we started through the recordings, and about half hour later, Jocko rolled a seven. No, Patsy, they're all old ones. Try this. Yeah. I'll put it down. I'll handle the needle. Uh, there. Crazy, Jackie. She'll know something's wrong. Let me handle it, friend. You just get into trouble. I don't want you to get into trouble, Jackie. Will you let me worry? You get back to the hotel. I'll meet you at the Kenwood right after. It's too late. She's coming now. I'll get down as soon as you call, Jackie. You made a mistake, Joe. It's one time you shouldn't have hurried. That's it up, Jocko. Let's get up to Kenwood. Why don't we think it over a while? Put the record down and come on there at the Kenwood. You heard the shots. That's what I'm worried about. If that fellow's any kind of a mechanic, he's had time to reload. <laughs> I got down to headquarters and told Hellman why that girl, Tony Pritchard, lost her vote. We rode out to the Kenwood and Hellman started through the register. There was no Jackie Wren listed and we didn't have any better luck with the girl. I briefed the desk clerk and he said he thought there were two people in the hotel who looked like that, but he didn't know their names. Well, all we could do was wait for him to show. So Hellman and I walked down the street and slid into the car. It must have been about three o'clock and for the next four hours we sat in there. About 7 o'clock, it began to rain harder. It wasn't easy to see the front of the Kenwood. I got out to wipe the windshield, and that was a mistake, because just then, the door of the hotel swung open. The girl came out first, and then Jackie ran. He saw me right away, and the two of them jumped over to the curb and got into a car. Riding with Hellman's, just about as safe as eating an arsenic sandwich. When we got to the corner, they turned east and started down Bush. 
It wasn't easy to stay behind him. The rain was hitting the windshield, and it was like trying to see through a mint julep. When we got past Jones, Hellman began to close in. It must have scared Wren too much because it stopped and he swung the car around with Hellman a few feet behind and it was a dead end both ways. He can't get out now. Open the door. Yeah. There he is, over to the wall. Over here, Hellman. He'll go down that embankment on the other side. Well, he can't. It's too steep. Stay on this side. Can you see him? No. But he's around, I think. You got a chance now, Wren. Come on out. I don't like you that well, mister. It's over there by the embankment. Can you see the girl? She's with him. Over to one side. Move up in front. Oh, you're confused, Hellman. I pay the taxes. It's gonna hurt from now on, Ren. I'm coming over. I hope you make it, copper. All right, copper. Unless you want a medal, I'm through. You don't need the gun, then. Get rid of it. Just toss it over there. Can't even lift my arm. Throw it down, mister. Jackie, Jackie, please. I'll throw it right at you. Come on. Good. Francine, you crazy woman, you crazy. You let him kill me. He's going over that embankment. You let him kill me right in front of you. Ah! No. No, Jackie. Please, Jackie, I tried to stop you. I tried to stop you, Jackie. Never, Novak, she's going over. Leave me alone. Oh, honey. Jackie, I want you. Forever. I want you, Jackie. At least they can let me have this. Jackie! Ah! Long way down. Yeah. Too bad her name wasn't Jill. Last I saw Francine, she was lying down at the bottom in the rain. Her head was over to one side, and you knew with a little push she'd roll around as easy as a ball bearing on a plate. Her face was clean, but the rain was beginning to wash the dirt down, and when I left, she wasn't pretty anymore. Jackie Wren outlasted her by a few hours, and Hellman used them all. Agnes Bolton was carrying government papers bound for China. The four people were split into teams. Jackie Wren and Francine were trying to outbid Joan Hayward and the little guy. The way Jackie had it figured, he'd find out what ship they were going out on and pick it up from there. Joan Hayward knew he was dealing with me, so she followed me after I left that barber shop. She saw me park the car in that garage and tailed me down to the bowling alley. She planted the needle in Agnes Bolton's purse, and the little guy tagged along behind waiting for something to happen. Just to be on the safe side in case anything went wrong... Joan doubled by the office and gave Francine a headache. When the little guy got the green bag, he took it to Joan. It was too good to split, so she killed him and left him in my car. Well, then she made a mistake. When Jackie called her up and asked her to come down to the gold bar club, she bought the story. Oh, it would have worked out fine for Jackie if he hadn't talked in front of that microphone. But a nosy girl heard it and tried to put the screws on him. Well, Hellman asked only one question. About that conversation between Jackie and the girl. Why would a person say anything that private in front of a microphone? I don't know. But I told him about a couple of others Jocko and I heard. He didn't say anything. But I'll bet he gets a hold of those records and plays them every night before he goes to sleep.
Welcome back. Told you, Dean Atchison. Dean Atchison. Um, there were so many remarkable things about this episode. I will always remember this as the episode where Pat Novak didn't go down. He knocked somebody else out. Uh, when I first heard this episode, I wanted to stand up and cheer. He stayed conscious. Way to go, Patsy. Uh, this episode also seemed to have the most uh, hard-boiled bo- hard uh, similes of any episode of Pat Novak heretofore. Uh, now, some of them, of course, uh, they were all pretty good, except for at the beginning, where I think he went over the top with uh, remarking on uh, on uh, Miss Bolton's white. Of course, and uh, of course, this episode's notable for having somebody stand in for Hellman. Uh, I mean, for Raymond Burr's Hellman, uh, and I don't know qu- quite know who uh, who it was. Don't recognize the voice anywhere. Um, uh, but uh, Raymond Burr not in this I, I believe I heard him later in the series because uh, I've listened just a little bit ahead there's actually not all that much ahead here uh, so overall a very uh, interesting and fun episode and uh, if you if you got the app you can just go ahead and uh, favorite that so that you can always listen again if you need a good string of similes <laughs> All right, well, we've got uh, one more comment on Podcast Alley uh, uh, at podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Friendly commentary and good rotation of shows. Keep them coming. And we certainly will. Thanks for the comment, Anders. Uh, and reminder, please cast your vote at podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. On Thursday, we will be adding the extra uh, Basil uh, Rathbone in Captain Blood, and then on Saturday, uh, be listening for, or or actually watching for our monthly video special, Sherlock Holmes and the Secret Weapon. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you this week's episode of Let George Do It. Got any comments on the show? Send them my way, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, please uh, visit our Facebook page, facebook.greatdetectives.net. Reminder, we have a tip jar right over at greatdetectives.net. Um, and uh, you can also pick up our app, app.greatdetectives.net. Uh, good for your iPod Touch or for your iPhone. It allows you to favorite episodes and also uh, to be able to hear bonus content including bonus episodes uh, of the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio featuring some of our detective uh, stars in some of their non-detective roles. All right, well, we're going to get into today's episode of Let George Do It. Uh, this episode is actually known by a couple of names. Um, it's, it's known as Hired for a Bodyguard by OTRR. Um, old-time radio researchers. However, Digital Deli uh, gave the name of a piece of pl- publicity, um, which actually sounds like a much snappier title, so we're going to go with that. So this is uh, Let George Do It, a piece of publicity, and then we will come back. <laughs> Standard of California, on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West, invites you to Let George Do It. Another adventure of George Valentine. Personal notice, danger is my stock and trade. If you need confidential help with anything you can't tackle alone, you've got a job for me, George Valentine. Write full details. <laughs> Dear Mr. Valentine, no doubt you have heard of me. My name is on circus billboards all over the city. Martha Dvorak, the most glamorous trapeze artist in the world. My work requires nerves of steel, but instead I'm shaking like a jellyfish. I have great fear, fear for my life, and cannot go to the police. Do not trouble to answer this. I will not take no for an answer. Take no for an answer. 
I may even be in your office before you receive this letter. Oh. So be sure to expect me. Hmm. Sign Marta Dvorak. <laughs> well, a young lady on the flying trapeze has a quaint way of setting up her words. And have you seen those posters, George? I'll bet there isn't a male in the audience who doesn't sit there wishing Marta would fall into his lap. That's a very charming thought. But I wish she was more specific about this great fear for her life. Well, I'm giving odds there's a rejected suitor involved. Oh, come on, woman. Stop acting like a woman. If you read the tabloids, darling, you'd know Marta's left quite a trail of broken hearts. A femme fatale, huh? Mm-hmm. Very interesting. I am Marta Devorak. Ooh. If you are Mr. Valentine, please ask this young lady to leave. We want to be alone. Oh, now look, Mr. Devorak, this is Miss Brooks, my assistant. You have no objection to being alone with me? Besides... That is the only way I will discuss this business. Oh, honest, Mr. Vorak, I'm over 21, if that's what you're worried about. Well, Mr. Valentine. Uh, I'm scrape, Brooksy. Huh? Hmm. Well, now, Mr. Vorak, what can I do for you? First, you can call me Martha. Oh, how nice. Martha. Well? From now on, until the death-defying Dvorak leave here, you must be with me at my side all the time. Oh, no, wait a minute. That's a tall order, Martha. Here. Read this note. Huh? Get five thousand dollars in small bills and wait for further instructions. You will either pay or meet with a bad accident. Don't take this to the police. You are being watched. Well, that's certainly to the point. So you see, I'm helpless, George. I'm like a little girl in a bad dream. Yeah. And as I get it, you want me to act as your bodyguard. Yes. You will bodyguard me every minute. Oh, uh, look, why don't you stick close to your family, the other death-defined of Orax? They wouldn't let anything happen to you. My family. They're not my family at all. Oh, well, live and learn. It just looks good on the circus posters. The three others. Sometimes I think they hate me. Oh, they're jealous. They know the people come to see me and not them. I see what you mean. I do not even stay at the same hotel with them. I've rented a little house up in the canyon. Well, look, you know, this may turn out to be just a crank note. The words are all cut out of magazines and newspapers. Somebody wishes to see me die, crushed, defeated. You would not let that happen to me, would you, George? Oh, now, look. You will bodyguard me. I will be so grateful. Many dollars grateful. Oh, well, okay, it's a deal. You've convinced me. Oh, this is wonderful. I think I will kiss you. Huh? No, I will not even think. I will kiss you. Oh, no. Wait a minute, Marty. You're... Oh, please, Marty. I'd... I'd rather have you as a friend. Oh, you're cute, George. Always you joke. Hmm, yeah. Now, what are your plans for the day? I have a rehearsal right now at the circus. Will you meet me at the matinee? Yeah, I'll be seeing you. Come early so you can see my act. Oh, sorry. <laughs> of course, you were not listening at the door. Oh, of course I was. In fact, I was peeking through the keyhole. Really? Au revoir, George. Yes, so long. Well, Casanova? Hmm? Oh, that kiss. Well, you know, Brooksy, these artists, so impulsive. Nice fight you put up. George. Oh, no, Angel, it's all business. Well, if you think I'm going to let you traipse around with that, that high-flying she-wolf, oh, temper, temper, I'll be temper. on your heels every minute. Oh, no, Brooksy, you can't do that. Oh, can't I? <laughs> From now on, I'll be known as the Shadow. <laughs> well, Miss Brooks, after you phoned, I made a full check on the Dvorak game. I want to find out, Lieutenant Riley. Your little hunch was right. She's playing your boyfriend for a patsy in a little game known as space grabbing. Publicity. I see. She's either pulled or tried to pull this threatening note gag in every city where the circus stopped. She was driving the police nuts till they got wise to her. Yeah. Oh, but if I know George, it won't make any difference to him. He's as stubborn as a tray of ice cubes. He keeps saying, but suppose this note is on the level. <laughs> well, well, cheer up, cheer up. Nobody's going to take away Valentine's Dick Tracy button just for looking for a boogeyman who isn't there. Yes, but Lieutenant, he's no more than a hired man with nothing to do. Nothing but hang around that international pinup girl and stare at that that man wanted sign in her eyes. <laughs> oh, Lieutenant Riley. <laughs> 
I know it's almost time for your act to go on, Mr. Dvorak. Whatever but... you want to know about little Martha, I can tell you, Mr. Valentine. People think I'm her father. Well, I am her father, confessor, her teacher, the great Leo Dvorak, who taught her everything she knows today. Yes, but about that note... I'm heartsick about Martha. After everything I've done for her, she's thinking of leaving the act and going to Hollywood. The thought is not easy to bear. But, of course, I wish her all good luck. Of course I do. I don't know anything about that note, Mr. Valentine. But I'll tell you something. Well? Everything is Martha, Martha, Martha. But does anyone know there's a girl named Reese in Act Two? Did I go up there every performance? Yes, I'm sure you have a very important place in the act, Reese. Oh, but... yes. I have the other bill for Spence for her big moment. So people will think of nothing else. But what would happen to that beautiful body if she fell? Oh, don't talk to me about Martha. Teresa, you were going to tell me something. Yes, Mr. Valentine. I hate her. Yes, Mr. Valentine. I'm the one who catches Martha up there. Yes, Dorian, Leo told me. I have her life in my hands. One little slip, uh, an accident, and no one would know the difference. I tell her that when she makes a fool of me, goes out with other men, she just laughs. She knows I could never hurt her. I love her too much. But, Dorian, you still didn't tell me if you know who might have sent her that letter. Letter? Oh, I'm sorry I know nothing about it. Now, if you'll excuse me, our cue is coming up. I've been talking to Lieutenant Riley, and I was right. That woman's a phony. This is a publicity stunt. Okay, Brooksy, okay. So I'm playing the fall guy in a publicity stunt. Mm-hmm. But it would make it a lot easier if you'd stop following me around. Oh, George. Oh, all right, come on. Ladies and gentlemen, your attention, please, for the thrilling highlight of the afternoon. That sensational European act. A breathless two with the law of gravity. And there they are, ladies and gentlemen, 200 feet above your very head. The one and only death-defying the Morax. trapeze above her. I saw when Dorian reached out to catch her, she deliberately slipped one hand out of his. You don't know what you're oh, saying. crazy. Teresa is right, of course. Martha. That is what I did, exactly. Just one hand, Martha. I might have dropped you. No, Dorian, darling. You would have let your arm come off before you let me fall. When will you learn to think of the act, the act? All those thousands of people will never stop talking about what they think nearly happened to me. And tomorrow... The newspapers, well, they will be beautiful. Shall we go, George? Elliot, Mr. Borak, all I can get is a nervous breakdown. I just love camping out in the lobby of your apartment house, darling. Mm. I suppose you think you're cute giving me the slip tonight. George, why have you got your hand over your eye? Oh, it's nothing. Well, let me see. Okay, nosy look. Uh-oh. Uh-huh. A black eye, an overgrown mouth. Oh, I can see that, but where did you get it? Well, it seems someone else besides you decided to follow me. Oh? And after I dropped Marta off at the canyon, he caught up with me. Who's he? Oh, I don't know, Angel. I was tripping gaily past a dark alley, and I encountered a king-sized fist. Hmm. Well, I wouldn't put it past Marta to have someone pop you like that, just to keep you interested till the circus leaves town. Well, Brooksy, you'll be happy to know I told Marta I was off the merry-go-round. 
Well, it took you a week to say uncle, but congratulations. George! George! Uh-oh, the call of the wild. Oh, now don't tell me. Is it fire, flood, or pestilence? This Another time? no, George. Oh, no. I found it in my mailbox. Look, Martha, dear, won't your bodyguard black eye get you enough space in the papers tomorrow? What? Oh, George, I was so upset. I did not know. Yeah. Yes. Nice. Got a spare filly mignon in your pocketbook? Okay, what about the note? Here. Oh, what do you know? So far, you have obeyed instructions. We know there is no circus tomorrow, so be at your house with the $5,000 and be there alone. But, George, I cannot be alone. I'm too frightened. Uh, pardon me for being cynical, but you don't frighten easy. Am I supposed to forget what you did on that trapeze to get another publicity story for your scrapbook? Oh, but I'm so sure something terrible would happen to me. Frankly, Marta, I don't believe a word you've told me. Hallelujah. George, how can you say that? However, yes? I will stay with you out at the canyon tomorrow. But you just said you didn't believe a word I know, you... Brooksy, I know. But you see, I've had one eye closed for me tonight. Well? Well, strangely enough, I'm beginning to see things a lot clearer now with the other one. Return to tonight's adventure of George Valentine in just a moment. Meanwhile, a word about summer car care. If you sometimes find summertime motoring plenty warm, how about your car's engine? Upper cylinder walls, for example, take a terrific beating. Temperatures in there get hotter than a blowtorch. Ordinary motor oils would run away from hot spots, leave upper cylinder walls bare and exposed to wear. But RPM motor oil is tailor-made to guard vital parts. Special compounds in premium quality RPM keep a cooling coat of oil clinging on every inch of your engine, every second. Make RPM stick to the job. RPM also keeps a protective film of oil on parts even when your engine's idle. The oil is on working parts before you st touch the starter. There's no waiting for oil to pump up, no damaging startup wear. So to keep your engine safe at all times, get compounded RPM motor oil at independent Chevron gas stations or standard stations where they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. And now back to tonight's adventure of George Valentine. Well, George was convinced that Marta Dvorak, glamorous trapeze artiste, hired him as a bodyguard strictly for the sweet uses of a publicity. Then a black eye administered in the darkness by a person or persons unknown, strangely enough, opened his eyes to something that still remains to be seen. At any rate, George is back on the job. And he and Marta are alone now in her house on Canyon Road, just outside of town. Look, Marta, stop waving that $5,000 around like cigar coupons. It makes me nervous. Oh, I just thought I would have it ready for those people so there would be no, no unpleasantness. Yeah. How is it that last night you were quaking in your little open-toe sandals and today you're a blind spirit? How can I be afraid of anything when you are so near me? Uh, yeah. But not half so near enough. Now, if we were like this, huh? I could laugh in the face of anyone who came in that door. Anyone. Now, isn't this just too cozy? So, you, Miss Brooks. Uh huh. How dare you? Don't laugh so hard, Mark. Doesn't anyone have a kind word for a poor police lieutenant on his day off? Oh, I thought you always went fishing, Lieutenant Riley. Well, Miss Brooks here persuaded me it would be better sport to get a load of Operation Phony. Miss Brooks, this is your idea of humor. Oh, I know you didn't expect visitors, so I brought along the loveliest picnic basket. Liverwurst, knockwurst, pickle lily. Oh, Martha, you have made me so happy. Leo, uh, who's a this? visitor. I cannot tell you how I felt when you invited me here for today. What? I invited you. I never did. But that is very strange. A young lady called the hotel and left a message. What young lady? Who could have done a thing like... Oh. Oh, uh, we may as well know each other. Mr. Dvorak, this is Lieutenant Ryle. How do you do? Harry, he is very happy, Martha. We have not been very close together lately. Oh, please, Leo. I wonder if I brought enough pika lily for everybody. Pika lily? What is this uh, pika lily, young lady? Why don't you come out and let me show you, Leo? I have to put these things in the refrigerator anyway. Oh, this is wonderful. Oh, I'm always crazy for a quiet day in the car. Oh, I could kill somebody. And I think I know who. Uh, me too. Well, Martha, here I am. Darling, not you too? And Risa? Yes, I met Risa getting out of a cab when I drove up. And I got her message inviting me to spend the day here. I just found Now I come. will kill just somebody. Just to see what it is you're up to now. But, uh, these people, Martha, we, we're going to be alone. 
On the phone, that's what the young lady said. Oh, now, there's a young lady who gets around. Are you again making a fool of me, Martha? Please, darling, I'm not one of your scenes. Ah, this fresh country, yeah. Congenial company. Yes, Valentine, I think this is going to be a day to remember. I will not go back into that house. Oh, now, Moira, that's not being a charming hostess. It is already evening, and they just sit there. Oh, that should be all right with you. Have you forgotten that note? The safety in numbers, you know. Now, come on, let's get inside. Well, all right. Hey, hold it. Hmm? Didn't you take in your mail today? Of course. Why? Here's a letter in the mailbox. I'm in no mood for letters. Huh? Huh? Yes? Another one of those little love notes. <laughs> Very impossible. Yeah, but here it is. But I told you, it is impossible. It cannot be. I did not... You... You didn't what? Never mind. Let me have it. Well, what does it say? It says, you did not live up to the bargain. You invited a house full of people. You know what to expect now. George... George. Oh, look, you don't have to put on that act for my benefit, Marta. We're all troopers now. But I tell you, this is real. You've I been not... writing these notes to yourself, haven't you? I know I will not make you believe me. But I've got to get away from here, I'm afraid. Wait a minute, Marta. I'm afraid of everything. Hey, don't be a fool. I've got to get away from here. Okay, okay, if you want to see who can run faster. But this is your last temperamental fling with me. Look, Miss Brooks, look, I pounded the beat for 15 years before I became a lieutenant. My feet hurt. They're killing me. Come on, let's get back to the house. But Lieutenant George and Maude have been away so long, I'm really worried. Yeah, I'm worried they're smooching somewhere. Oh, maybe George was right and those notes weren't phony. Anything connected with that dame has to be phony. Now, come on, let's get back to the house. Oh, okay. Well, let's take one look up here in the Lemon Grove. <sighs> all right, all right, but take it easy. Wait till I put the flashlight on. Lieutenant, what? look, over there. Valentine. George. Oh, wait till I have a look at him. Oh. Hello, everybody. Oh, George. I was just thinking of getting up anyway. What happened? I was with Marta, trying to talk some sense into her. Yeah? Suddenly somebody staged an atomic test right in back of me. That's all I know. Hey, where is Marta anyway? Here's your answer. She's right here. <gasps> How is she? I'll tell you in a minute. George. Look, that money scattered all over. Her. Well, Lieutenant, she's dead. Strangled to death. Okay, the holiday's over now. Now you better get ready to answer a few questions. George, oh. you want me to get you something to your head? Yeah, no one, Brooksy. Well, we'll start with you, Leo. You admit you were out of the house when someone ran berserk in the lemon grove. Yes, I began to worry about my little Martha. I walked everywhere looking for her. She meant so much to me. Oh, admit it, Leo. You knew that without her there would be no act. That's all she ever meant to you. Didn't you happen to be outside too, Risa? What have you got to say? I can afford to be frank. I kept walking and walking, trying to forget how much I hated her. As long as we are all being so honest, Dorian, why do you not tell the lieutenant what you were doing out of the house? Tell him how jealous of Martha you always were. Well, why not? Everyone knows about it. I loved Martha, and I was jealous of every move she made. Jealous of every moment except when she was flying through the air, her hands reaching for mine. Depending on me, of all men. I would never see her hurt. You remember when she said that, Valentine? Yeah, I remember. What about the question, Dorian? Why did you leave the house? Where did you go? Looking for Martha. We didn't have a minute together all day. She was always with Valentine. Oh, fine, fine. Everybody's out for a walk when mayhem breaks out. You aren't even listening, George. Doesn't any of this interest you? Hmm, Brooksy? What are you doing with your nose in that magazine? Oh, it's the show world. Huh? I've learned some fascinating things from it. Oh, meaning what? Well, for instance, Brooksy and you were right, Lieutenant. Martha did send herself those two notes. You mean three notes, don't you? Uh-uh. 
The third note was the real McCoy, Lieutenant. Yeah? The business. What? And you found that out just looking at Marta's legs in that magazine? Well, in a way, Brooksy. Now, here. Just take a look at these three notes. I'm all eyes. What yeah. about them? All addressed to Marta Dvorak. Yeah, Canyon Road 58. Canyon Road 58 and 58 Canyon Road. That's the what? Uh-huh. Now, take a close gander at this third note. The words for it were cut out of this page of the Show World magazine. Well, so oh, that's right. I turn over said page and presto, we have a full-page photograph of Marta herself. Yes, one of the most beautiful she ever took. But what are you trying to say, Mr. Valentine? This magazine was sent to Marta. Knowing her as well as we all do, I doubt that we can imagine her cutting up a picture of herself. Not in a million years. That is right. She kept scrapbooks of the smallest items about herself. She lived on public... Oh, right. I see, so see. What? That's why she was so terrified when she received that third note. It was one she didn't send to herself. Any ideas who did? Uh, ideas? The way I feel? Um, no, Lieutenant. It's, uh, it's all yours from here on in. Stepping aside, George? That roughing up you got must be more serious than I thought. Are you sure you're all right? Oh, well, uh, yeah. gosh, I, I don't know, Brooksy. I'd, I'd better find out. Now, uh, when I was a kid, every time I fell out of the apple tree, my mother used to say, she used to say, George, there's one sure way of telling if you're still all right in the head. Hey, what is this? Yes, this is no time to hear what your mother used to say. Yeah, Georgie, she'd say, uh, just try to remember the Mother Goose rhymes I taught you. But please, Mr. Valentine, how can you make jokes now? Now, uh, let's see if I can remember. Now, uh, how does that one go again? Which one, darling? Oh, you know, the uh, Mary had a little lamb. It's wool. No, no, that's fleece. The fleece was white as uh, something or other. And wherever the little lamb would go, Mary would be sure to follow. Well, that's very cute, George, but not quite the original. Oh. Say, if I can't remember a simple nursery rhyme, I must be pretty bad. Hey, wait a minute. I'll try another. Why must we stand here and listen to this man talk and say nothing? That is right. Take it easy, friends. Take it easy. We'll have to wait till the car is through anyway. Go on, Valentine. Go on. I'm willing to wait for you to make sense. Yeah, well, I'll try. Um, little Miss Muffet sat on a... Puffet? No. A Ruffet. No, that's not it. Hey, Tuffet. That's it. Tuffet. Munching? No. Uh, chewing? No, that's not it either. Eating her... Her curds and whey. Curds and whey. Any school child knows that, you fool. Now, let's stop this farce. You seem to forget Martha has been killed tonight. No, Dorian, no one's forgetting. You staged it too well. Oh, All right. You know better than to say that. All right, Valentine. I've been patient up till now. Come on, give. Tell me, Dorian... Do you come from Wisconsin, Brooklyn, or Georgia? Not uh, that that concerns you, but I was born in Switzerland. I've never been in America before this tour. Did all the school kiddies in Switzerland learn about Little Miss Muffet and her curves and way? Well, I don't know. I, I suppose uh, so. Uh, no European kid would know about curves and way. And I think it'll be a pretty simple matter to prove you were born right here in America. No, I... All right. What of it? I went to school in Switzerland. I pretended to be a foreigner for professional reasons. There's nothing wrong about that. When you were a kid here in America, you learned more than nursery rhymes. When you addressed an envelope, you were taught to put the number of the house before the name of the street. That's something you never forgot. It stuck with you. And that's just what's going to hang you. Let's have that in nice, simple language, Valentine, huh? The kind of jewelry will understand. Okay, Lieutenant. The first two notes, the ones Marta wrote to herself, read Canyon Road 58. The third one she found tonight was written by Dorian, the only one in the troop not European. It read 58 Canyon Road. The number before the name of the street, Lieutenant. American style. You know, Valentine, in my job, I see a lot of human nature, but this Dorian guy... He's a breed all his own. No, it was Marta I couldn't understand. Now I feel sorry for her. I think I know what you mean about Dorian, Lieutenant. He had every chance to kill her when he was up there on the trapeze and get away with it. Mm. Instead, he writes that letter and makes a super production out of it. Jealousy. Jealousy. Had it bad, Lieutenant. Bad enough to sock me in the eye for no other reason but that I was spending so much time with her. <laughs> well, how could anyone be jealous of a little thing like that? After all, it was just your job. Uh-huh. Now, the truth is, Lieutenant, a simple accident wasn't good enough for Dorian. 
Marta had to know she was dying and that he was killing her. That's the only way it would satisfy his bruised and battered ego. Uh, as good an explanation as any. You know, it's strange. Marta dreamt of having a story about herself in every newspaper in the country. She certainly tried hard enough. Yeah, Brooksy. And when she finally made it, it was only to let the world know that she'd never be heard of again. If your car's battery has been acting like a mule, temperamental and balky, here's an easy way to cure it. Have your battery serviced at a standard station or independent Chevron gas station. They'll inspect the water level, cables, terminal clamps, and test the battery's condition. And they'll be frank. If it just needs a charge, they'll tell you. If your battery's really on its last legs, they'll explain how a new Atlas battery can save you money. Every Atlas battery has its certified power capacity stamped on the case where you can read it. And you'll find these capacities meet or exceed standards set by the Society of Automotive Engineers. The longer-lasting starting power of Atlas batteries, by the way, is backed by a written warranty honored everywhere by 40,000 Atlas dealers. Independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations are glad to service your battery, proud to offer you an Atlas battery when you need one. That's why they say and mean we'll take better care of your car. Next week, when you tune our way for another adventure of George Valentine, you'll hear... I got here as soon as I could, Brooksy. Edward's still in the club there? Yes, George, and getting very fidgety. All right, all right. Are you sure about that check he's carrying? Of course. I saw the signature, Agnes Ebersole. Oh, good. Now go back inside and stick right with friend Daniel. But well, what are you going to do, George? Oh, that's the surprise, Angel. But hold your hat. Because in just about five minutes, I'm going to start the biggest commotion that nightclub has seen in years. <laughs> adventure of George Valentine has been brought to you by Standard of California on behalf of independent Chevron gas stations and standard stations throughout the West. Let George Do It stars Robert Bailey as George with Francis Robinson as Claire. Wally Mayer appears as Lieutenant Riley. Tonight's story was written by David Victor and Herbert Little Jr. and directed by Don Clark. Also heard in the cast were Gene Bates as Marta, Louis Van Ruten as Leo, Don Diamond as Dorian, Peggy Weber as Rita, and Dick Ryan as the ringmaster. The music is composed and conducted by Eddie Dunstetter. If it's safer, it's better. This is the key to accident prevention in Western living. The 3,000 delegates who will attend the 10th Annual Western Safety Conference in Hollywood from June 16th through June 18th will formulate safer procedures in every phase of public and private life. Their work will make your future safer. They say it's smart to be safe. Take their advice. Your announcer, John Heaston. Listen again next week, same time, same station, to Let George Do It. This is the Mutual Don Lee Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Well, another great episode of Let George Do It. Uh, that end part was practically Columbo-esque. Um, the way that he got the, uh, uh, got the murderer to confess and egged him on. Uh, that's the one thing about this show. This is one of those shows you've got an idea, say, when you listen to Sherlock Holmes or uh, Pat Novak or... Um, or Philip Marlowe, or Sam Spade, kind of what the general type of story you, you, you can expect is. Uh, but I'll let George do it. They really uh, miss, uh, mix it up. And I love some of uh, uh, Claire Claire's, uh, Brooks's lines. Uh, fantastically delivered, and just great fun here in, the, in this episode. So... All right, well, we're going to be back uh, next week with another Let George Do It. Join us tomorrow for uh, another for Sherlock Holmes, and we'll have uh, a little bonus old-time radio for you. 
uh, if you want to hear a little more of Basil Rathbone and a lot more of Errol Flynn. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you this week's episode of Sherlock Holmes. If you got a comment, send it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley, podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. Remember to take our listener survey. If you have not already, survey.greatdetectives.net. Um, if you have our app, um, if you go, if you click on this episode to listen to it and click on extras, you should have uh, a little something special. Uh, it's more by Basil Rathbone outside of the detective genre. Uh, here he stars um, uh, behind Errol Flynn. Uh, in the Lux Radio Theater presentation of Captain Blood. So it's swashbuckling fun with uh, Basil Rathbone. Uh, you can go ahead and ch- uh, t- check that out. If you don't have the app, go to app.greatdetectives.net and you are able to purchase it or, purchase it or just search the iTunes store. All right. Um, well, this is going to be uh, very special because we're going to start to get some consistency in the show. So far, there have been uh, there actually were 171 episodes of Sherlock Holmes uh, that had been recorded starring Basil Rathbone and Nigel Bruce uh, all through March 19th of 1945, the week before this show aired. Of those, we have been able to bring you a grand total of five of these. Now we're going to start to get into consistency. We have 47 of the last 49 episodes that we're going to be able to share with you. Uh, And these are some truly unique stories. Um, Most of the... um, uh, Most most of the... uh, original Sherlock Holmes stories they've already done. So these are going to be... uh, These are going to be very uh, unique... Uh, stories written especially for uh, this uh, incarnation, The New Adventures of Sherlock Holmes. So we're going to have some fun. Um, Before we do get started, I want to encourage you, as you make your travel plans for the new year, uh, please remember this name, johnnydollarair.com. Uh, JohnnyDollarAir.com can help save you money by getting you great deals on hotels, airline tickets, rental cars, and cruises. Uh, and that's important with the state of the economy. Uh, go to johnnydollarair.com, which is priceline.com. And if you find a good deal and opt to uh, make a purchase, uh, it helps the great detectives of old time radio. But let's go ahead and we'll, uh, we'll travel back to uh, 1945 for the Petri Wine sponsored presentation of Sherlock Holmes. This episode is The Book of Tobit. This episode from the life of Sherlock Holmes will be transmitted to our men and women overseas by shortwave and through the worldwide facilities of the Armed Forces Radio Service. Petri Wine brings you... Battle Rathbone and Nigel Bruce in the new adventures of Sherlock Holmes. The Petri family, the family that took time to bring you good wine... Invite you to listen to Dr. Watson tell us about an exciting adventure he shared with his old friend, that master detective, Sherlock Holmes. And so while you're getting comfortable, I'd like to tell you about an old, old American custom. The custom of serving a glass of sherry wine before dinner. Petri, California sherry. You know, Petri sherry is to a good meal what the overture is to a good musical comedy or an opera. Before you sit down at the dinner table, just pour yourself a little glass of Petri sherry and sip it slowly. Look at that beautiful amber color. Smell the fragrance of those sun-ripened grapes. And taste that fine sherry flavor. You'll agree with me, I'm sure, that Petri sherry is the best beginning a good meal ever had. And say, if you happen to like your sherry dry, as I do, you'll really like Petri pale dry sherry. Believe me, you can't go wrong with any wine that bears the name Petri, the proudest name in the history of American wines. Now let's drop in on the good Dr. Watson, who's waiting for us in his California ranch house. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening, Mr. Foreman. Come in and make yourself a toe. Oh, thank you, Doctor. Sitting here with the lights off, I see. Have you been getting yourself in the mood for tonight's Sherlock Holmes story? No, my boy, I was watching the sunset. It's quite a beautiful tonight. 
I docked her the sunset over an hour ago. Yes, I know that, young fellow, my lad. I know that. But at my age, a fellow's entitled to take a little snooze after dinner, isn't he? Of course he is, Doctor. And now that we've settled that, how about tonight's story? Well, a very beautiful girl figured prominently in this adventure, Mr. Foreman. Her name was Jasmine Lafleur. Huh? Say that again, Doctor, please. <laughs> I know, my boy, but that was her stage name. When she was a magician's assistant, unfortunately, I never had the opportunity of seeing Jasmine Lafleur in the theatre. But I'm told that she was a, a fascinating figure in tights and, and, and spangles. <laughs> when Holmes and I first met her, however, she was uh, dressed a little more conventionally. And her name was then Diana Venering. Lady Venering. Lady Venering? Say, those tights and spangles really paid off, didn't they? Well, how did you and Sherlock Holmes come to meet up with her, Doctor? In rather spectacular style, Mr. Foreman. Miss Lafleur became something of a femme fatale in the early 1900s. First of all, she married Signor Rossoni, the magician for whom she was working. On the wedding night, he was mysteriously stabbed to death. A few months later, Madame Rossoni, very fetching in her widow's weeds, I'm sure, met Sir Wilfred Venering. And, after a whirlwind courtship, she married him. Don't tell me he got murdered, too. He did, Mr. Foreman. Also on the night of the wedding. At this time, the police found a suspect. It was a certain Major Beckworth, cousin of the dead man, and an ardent suitor of the fair Diana. The trial at the Old Bailey was one of the most sensational I ever remember. Sherlock Holmes and I, in, in court on the closing day as a jury, were still considering their verdict. Holmes, the, the jury's been out over eight hours. I bet you they can't agree on a verdict and there'll be a new trial. I think not, old chap. Look, here they come now. You know, there's a strong moral probability of guilt, but I'm sure they'll agree that there's insufficient evidence to convict. Oh, perhaps you're right. Just look at Lady Venering down there ahead of us. What a, what a stunning woman. Yes, and a woman of great poise and courage. Here it comes. Gentlemen of the jury, have you arrived at a verdict? We have, my lord. How say you? Do you find the defendant guilty or not guilty? Not guilty. <laughs> Exactly. Come on, Watson. Let's get a breath of fresh air. Well, I was wondering, perhaps, if we shouldn't go over and congratulate Lady Venery. On what? The fact that her husband's murderer has not been found? Oh, I suppose you're right. You ever read the book of Turbid, Watson? Turbid? I don't think so. When was it published? Well, a little before our time, old chap. It's an Old Testament story. <laughs> Whatever made you think of it at this moment? Well, it's so remarkably... Apposite with a case of Lady Fenring. It deals with a highly peculiar series of murders, seven of them, if I remember correctly. Who's the murderer? A jealous demon by the name of Asmodeus, who strangled husbands on their wedding nights. Well, judging by the verdict just now, Mr. Beckworth isn't the Asmodeus, or whatever you call him in this case. Here, boy, here. Give me a paper. Thank you, Governor. Thank you. Paper! Paper! Well, Holmes, what does it say? Oh. Wait a minute. Here we are. Listen to this. Oh. Lady Venering, widow of the murdered man, says that she will marry the suspect. Lady Venering told newspaper reporters this afternoon that if Major Beckwith is acquitted, she will marry him before the year is out. Oh, from my soul, Holmes, there's a positive sparkle in your eyes. You read about her. I must admit the lady fascinates me, old chap. I hope before she becomes involved in any further tragedies that we may have the opportunity of meeting her. And something tells me that we will. <laughs> The papers are certainly having a field day over the Venering case, Holmes. <laughs> Did you read them? No, I didn't, Watson. There's a complete life history of Lady Venering in one of them with photographs. It's uh, rather interesting. Really? What are you doing over there, Holmes? Looking out of the window. Ah, yes, yes. You expecting anybody, Holmes? No, come over here, old fellow. Oh, it's, a, it's a clergyman. Yes, a very agitated one. Look at the way he's pacing up and down. And looking up at our window, too. Uh, Joe, what eyes? Yes, there's a fanatical look about him, which suggests either the martyr at the stake or the inquisitor lighting the faggots. Mrs. Hudson's letting him in now. Well, I'll be interested to know what he's come to us about. I can hear footsteps on the stairs here. I'll, I'll go and have a look. Oh, 
How do you do, sir? Uh, come along in, won't you? It's all right, thank you, Mrs. Hudson. You're Mr. Sherlock Holmes? I am, sir, and this is my colleague, Dr. Watts. My name is Whalen, the Reverend Arthur Whalen. How do you do, How sir? How do you do, sir? Sit down, would you, and uh, tell me what I can do for you. Oh, thank you. Uh, Mr. Holmes, this, uh, this is a very difficult subject to broach. In fact, it's only after intense personal conflict that I've been able to force myself to come to. May I ask you, are you familiar with the Book of Tobit? Book of Tobit? Gracious me. You, you were talking about that yesterday, Holmes. I see that you've come to consult me about the Venering case. But that's amazing. How did you know? Has Lady Venom been in touch with you? Uh, no, sir, but uh, I'm familiar with the book of Tobit. Uh, Lady Venering's case firstly resembles that of the woman Sarah in the Old Testament story. More closely than you realize, Mr. Holmes. Did you know that before each one of Lady Venering's husbands was killed, they received a threatening note? Yes, I recall that from the trial. Signed in some sort of gibberish, weren't there? No, Doctor. Yesterday I was permitted for the first time to examine one of these notes. The apparent gibberish was, in reality, ancient Hebrew writing. Indeed. Were you able to translate it? Yes, Mr. Holmes. In effect, it said, If you go through with this marriage, your hours are numbered. And it was signed Asmodeus. The name of the jealous demon who strangled husbands in the Book of Tobit. Exactly. Just why have you come to me, sir? I want you to talk to Diana, uh, (laughs) to Lady Vannering, to tell her she must not go through with this new marriage. Mother is stalking her, Mr. Holmes. I have argued with her, prayed with her, implored her to realize her danger. But she is adamant. Ah, I'm afraid I should feel extremely presumptuous in giving her my advice. No, Mr. Holmes. I have prepared the way for you. You could, I'm sure, and her realize her danger. And she's willing to see me, you say? Willing and anxious. Oh, very well. But I'd like to ask you a few questions first. Anything, Mr. Holmes. What is your interest in her? She is, she's a member of my flock. She needs my guidance. Nothing further? No, no, Mr. Holmes. Well, I, I believe that you uh, performed the marriage ceremony at both of her previous weddings. Yes. Are you proposing to officiate the uh, ceremony if she marries Major Beckwith? Well, I... Uh, I don't know. I'm hoping that marriage will never take place. And so I want you to help me, Mr. Holmes. Hmm. Where does the lady live? 47, Barclay Square. Very well. Uh, Dr. Watson and I will call on her this afternoon. Mm, delighted to, delighted I doubt if I can be there myself. In fact, Diana might speak more freely if I'm not. Yes. But uh, here's my, my card. Oh, thank You'll you. You'll know where to get in touch with me if you want to. Very well, sir. Good day to you, gentlemen. And I, I'm greatly in your debt. Well, good day, good day. Hmm. Strange business, Holmes. I, I can't believe that Mr. Whalen's motives are entirely impersonal. Nor can I, old chap. <laughs> hmm? <laughs> what are you laughing about? I was thinking of the book of Tobit once. Hmm? In that the role of protector, the role I had just been asked to take, uh, was played by the Archangel Raphael. I can't help feeling, Watson, that I'm making distinct strides in my profession. Mr. Sherlock Holmes, I'm so glad to meet you. How do you do, Lady Venering? May I introduce my old friend, Dr. Watson? How are you, Dr. Watson? I'm awfully glad to meet you, Lady Vettering. <laughs> uh, let's sit down, shall we? You're just in time for oh, tea. Thank you. Um, you know why we're here, of course. Oh, naturally. Mr. Whalen came round here as soon as he'd left you. Uh, you were to persuade me to look after my mortal affairs uh, while he takes care of my immortal ones. Isn't that it? He takes care of my charming foot, Lady Vettering. Uh, may I say, Mr. Holmes, that I'm flattered that a man of your eminence should be sufficiently interested to bother about You me. underestimate your own importance, Lady Venering. Though I may mention that if your problem had been as simple as Mr. Whaler made it out to be, I might have been otherwise engaged. For being very frank and a little mysterious. Are you suggesting that Mr. Whalen didn't tell you everything? I am. And I hope you will be more candid with me. <laughs> Sherlock Holmes, I like you. <laughs> You're most refreshing. Uh, milk and sugar in your tea? Uh, just milk, thank you. Here you are. How about you, Dr. Watson? Oh, just the same way, please. Hey, thank you, my dear. And now, Mr. Holmes, perhaps you'll tell me why you think that you haven't been told everything. Before I answer that, uh, Lady Venering, I wonder if I might ask you some questions. But of course. Anything. When your first husband... Uh, Signor Sonny was killed. Did the police find any suspects? Uh, yes, one. Ferdinand Gautier, a young man who had been an assistant in our magician's act. 
a stupid, good-looking boy who thought he was in love with me. But, of course, Inspector Lestrade had to release him. There was no evidence. Inspector Lestrade, well, you can bet that if he arrested him, <laughs> the boy was innocent. A warning note was found among your husband's effects, wasn't it? Yes. And it was signed in Hebrew with the name Asmodeus. Uh, but perhaps you're not familiar with the Book of Tobit. Oh, yes, yes, I am. I'm familiar with it, Lady Venering. Uh, how did you know then that the Hebrew letter signified that name? Mr. Whelan translated them for me. Oh, I see. And also read me the Book of Tobit. Uh, he's always been particularly fond of that book. Perhaps because it illustrates his own ideas on the dangers of marriage. But Holmes told us that he hadn't seen one of the warning notes until yesterday. Precisely. Lady Venering, I read in the papers that you intend to marry Major Beckwith. The man who has just been tried for your late husband's murder. Yes, Mr. Holmes. When are you going to marry him, may I ask? When it pleases me. Doesn't it occur to you that uh, a great deal of comment will be caused? Also that Major Beckwith's life is in obvious danger? Of course it occurs to me, my dear man. But because of two tragic marriages, am I to spend the rest of my life alone? As Mr. Whelan would have me do. I'm young, alive. Peter! What are you doing here? I just arrived back in England today, Diana. What's this I read about you marrying Beckwith? Peter, I have guests. Mr. Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. This is Peter McComas, one of our most promising young painters. Oh, Diana, oh, tell me it isn't true. When I left England, you loved me, and I you. I come back and what do I find? You're planning to marry Beckwith. Well, I won't stand for it. If you think you can throw me over like some silly boy, you're very much mistaken. I can tell things, you know. I can tell lots of things. Get out of here, Peter. Get out. Diana. And don't come back until you've learned manners and discretion. But, but Diana... Get out. I'm sorry, gentlemen. Were there any more questions you wanted to ask me, Mr. Holmes? Uh, one, Lady Bennering. Uh, where is your fiancé, Major Beckwith? He's upstairs. Uh, I'm letting him stay here until the scandal of the trial has died down. I must see him at once. At once? Why, Holmes? He's in no danger until the marriage takes place? The marriage has taken place, Watson, and I'm very much mistaken. It makes you think so, Mr. Holmes. You're much too discreet and intelligent, Lady Venering, to let him stay here in your house unless you were already married. <laughs> we were married this morning. But we planned to keep the fact a secret for a few months until the scandal had died down. May I talk to him, please? Of course. I'll ring for the butler and ask him to come down. May I ask, uh, madam, who married you? The Reverend Arthur Whelan, of course. Oh, and all the time he talked to us today, he knew perfectly well this marriage had taken place. He must have just come from it. I don't trust that man, Holmes. Oh, there you are, Hudson. I just rang for you. Uh, will you ask Major Beckwith? Excuse to... me, lady. I, I was just on my way to telephone the police. The police? What do you mean? It's Major Beckwith, my lady. He's been stabbed to death in his bath. Mr. Beckwith murdered, too. Hudson, I'll telephone the police. I know I'm rather well acquainted with Inspector Lestrade. Excuse me, gentlemen. A dreadful business, Holmes. The third husband murdered on his wedding day. But what a woman, Watson. She's superb, magnificent. What on earth do you mean, Holmes? What courage. What unconquerable spirit in the face of a fresh tragedy. Watson, she fascinates me. I haven't seen such a splendid female since we solved that case for the King of Bohemia. Dr. Watson's story will continue in just a few seconds. Time enough to remind you that the easiest way to make good food taste better is to serve that good food with a swell Petri wine. And there are two Petri wines in particular just made to go with food. Petri California Sautern, a delicate white wine with a subtle flavor that's perfect with chicken and fish. And Petri California Burgundy, a hearty, rich red wine that's out of this world with any meat or meat dish. So if you want to know just how good a cook you are, serve your good food with Petri wine made to go with it. A Petri Burgundy or a Petri Sautern. Two swell Petri mealtime wines. <laughs> And now back to tonight's new Sherlock Holmes adventure. The famous detective and his old friend Dr. Watson have become involved in the affairs of thrice-married Diana, one-time magician's assistant. Each of her husbands has been mysteriously murdered on his wedding day, the latest murder occurring on the same day that Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson are brought into the case. 
As we rejoin our story, it's a month later, and for some obscure reason, Sherlock Holmes seems to have lost interest in the case, though not in the beautiful Diana. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mr. Stard? It's over a month now since Major Beckwith was murdered, and we haven't found a single clue to... Do you expect me to supply the deficiencies of Scotland Yard? Well, it's unlikely you not to help us, Mr. Holmes. And after all, you and Dr. Watson were in the house when it happened... If you ask me, the murderer's either McComas, that Irish painter, or the clergyman Wayland. What do you think, sir? As far as I'm concerned, the case is closed, Miss Arden. I wish you'd stop bothering me. What do you think I am? Nothing but a detecting machine? Mr. Holmes, whatever's come over you. Holmes, you're not going out again this evening, are you? I'm afraid so, old chap. Well, this will be the fourth night in a row. I was hoping that we might have a nice, quiet evening in... Of the fire. Oh, I'm sorry, Watson, but I promised to take Diana to the horse show at Olympia. I should be home by midnight. Mr. Holmes. Yes, Mr. Whalen. You're seeing altogether too much of Diana. She seems to be completely under your spell. But you introduced me to her in the first place with a request that I keep an eye on her. I made a great mistake. As her spiritual protector, I'm afraid I must ask you to stop seeing her. I'm afraid I must ask you, sir, to mind your own business. <laughs> I say, Holmes, have you seen the paper that that violinist, this Iwi, is playing at the Albert Hall tonight? Uh, no, I haven't looked at the paper today. Oh, I thought perhaps that we might go along and see Oh, I'm afraid I can't hold you up. No, I'm taking Diana to the French maid at Dahlia's Theatre. I hear it's a, a charming musical comedy. Look here, Holmes. We've been friends for a good many years now. Very true, old fellow. And I think I'm entitled to speak to you straight from the shoulder. Of course you are, Watson. Very well, then. This Diana Beckworth. Oh. Well, yes, it's your own business, I suppose. But I can't bear to see her making such a fool of you. You've neglected your work entirely since you met her. You get about as though you're a young fellow of 20. What's come over you, Holmes? Stop, stop pacing about, old chap, will you, and sit down. In fact, uh, it might be a good idea if you fortified yourself with a little brandy from the tantalus there. Uh, what I'm about to tell you... Uh, Maybe something of a shock. Um, Watson, uh, uh, Diana and I are getting married tomorrow. What did you say, Al? Um, I'm getting married tomorrow. But, uh, you're insane. Oh, that's not very flattering, Watson. Anyway, I don't see why you should be so surprised. You, you, you yourself married and left Baker Street once, didn't you? Well, for you, Holmes, a confirmed woman. Oh, no, 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 my dear Watson, no, indeed, no. You will remember in our adventure that you titled A Scandal in Bohemia, I met a lady that I have often referred to as a, oh, a the woman. You mean Irene Adler, but she was a criminal. Exactly, and yet Diana has the same magnificent characteristics. Keen intelligence, courage, and unconquerable spirit. At home, three of her husbands murdered on their wedding nights. You're proposing to be the fourth. Oh, rubbish, my dear fellow, because tragedy has attended her previous marriages. Is she to go through life alone? Holmes, you... Uh... You really mean it, don't you? Of course I do. I think I will have a nip of brandy. Oh, don't take it so badly, old fellow. We'll continue to see a lot of each other. Diana's very fond of you, you know. Oh, really? I'm I'm glad. Who's going to perform the ceremony? Not the... the Reverend Mr. Whaler? Oh, no, 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 no. We decided, in view of Diana's previous marriages, that he might prove to be a trifle, uh, well, unlucky. A clergyman named Bernay will officiate. Whalen, of course insists on being present just the same. Uh, what time is the wedding tomorrow? Two o'clock, old fellow. Oh, uh, I should have mentioned this before. I hope your cutaway coat and top hat are in a good state preservation. You'll be a pretty prominent figure at the ceremony, you know. You mean that... Uh, that... Well, I mean that uh, if Sherlock Holmes gets married, who else could be his best man but his old friend, Dr. Watson? It's elementary, my dear fellow, elementary. <laughs> I now pronounce you men and wife, and those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Diana, I'm going to claim the privilege of the best man and <laughs> give you a kiss. Of course you shall, Doctor. It's you, Holmes, you... you. Of course I am, old chap. Uh, Sherlock, I'm going upstairs to change my dress now. Very well, Diana. I'll be up shortly. I'll see you later, Dr. Watson. Very well, Mrs. Holmes. (laughs) Holmes, I I never thought I'd live to say that. 
Uh, what snow, fellow? I'm worried. Worried today? Oh, my dear fellow, what, what's the matter? Well, just before the ceremony, I received one of those warning notes signed by Asmodeus. Oh, you better be careful, Holmes. I think I'll slip out and have a pipe or two on the matter. Yes. Look after my guests for me, will you? And keep your eyes open and your ears. Yes, I will indeed. Oh, there you are, Mr. Whelan. Would you care for a glass of champagne or a punch or something or other? Thank you, no, Doctor. I'm in no mood for celebration. I'm certain that Diana has made a shocking mistake. Well, really, sir, I don't think... I only came here in a last-minute attempt to dissuade her. Now that I've failed, I shall leave. Good day, sir. Yes, sir. Dr. Watson? Oh, hello, McCormick. Where's Mr. Holmes? We'll be back in a few minutes. Would you care for a glass of champagne, sir? Thank you. I should like to drink a toast to the pair. I've been in love with Diana for years, you know, but she wouldn't marry me, and... Well, I suppose I might as well make the best of it. I, I must say, your friend Sherlock Holmes seems like a splendid fellow. He is indeed, McCormick. In fact, I may say... What? What? Excuse me, sir. All right, Holmes, I'm coming. Up here. What is the matter, Holmes? Follow me. Lock the door behind you. Allow me to introduce you to the demon Asmodeus, Watson. Unfortunately, at the moment, she's in a faint. Good Lord. Diana. Exactly. Always an impetuous woman, she made the mistake of trying to stab me with that knife. So I bent over to strap up a suitcase. She didn't allow for the wall mirror in which I was watching her. You mean you suspected her all along? Of course I did, old fellow. The problem was to find the proof. I first suspected her when I knew that she had been a magician's assistant. The key to the profession of magic is misdirection, and these murders have been a perfect example of misdirection motive. How do you mean, Holmes? Well, by creating Asmodeus... Thanks to the well-meaning stories of uh, the Reverend Mr. Whalen, whose theological libraries, she must have copied the Hebrew signature, she focused the murders on jealousy, concealing the fact that the one person with a perfect motive was herself, the widow who was to inherit. Oh, why hasn't she been caught before? Because she was clever, devilishly clever. She left no clues except an indirect one that I had once spotted, that the likeliest person to be able to approach a bridegroom unsuspected and stab him is his bride. Now I wish you'd see if you can revive her, old fellow. When the police get here, I should like Mrs. Holmes to be in full possession of all her faculties. Well, Holmes, I must say I never expected to be driving back with you to Baker Street on your wedding day. <laughs> I can't tell you how happy I feel. Dear yeah, old Watson, you really thought that I deserted you, didn't you? Well, naturally, I wish you'd tell me the truth. Why well, couldn't tell anyone? Not even you. If the faintest shadow of suspicion had entered our mind, I'd never have caught her. Well, it seems to me you paid a pay high price, Holmes. You told me you made a will in her favor. Supposing something happened to you before her trial, she'd get the money, you know. Oh, the will? Oh, no, that was worthless. I tell Diana... But it was a holographic will and perfectly valid. Well, what on earth is a holographic will? A uh, will drawn up in uh, one's own handwriting on a piece of perfectly plain paper. Such a document is quite legal, but I drew mine up on a paper with, uh, well, with a left head. That made it um, invalid. Well, I see, but the fact remains that you are married, Holmes. <laughs> I, I really fooled you completely, didn't I, Watson? Uh, uh, didn't the name of the clergyman who married us suggest anything to you? The Reverend Vernet? No, and why not should it? Well, Vernet was a French painter of some note. He also happens to have been a great uncle of mine and, um, you, Mycroft's. You mean that, that your brother Mycroft was a clergyman? I mean that Mycroft was disguised as a clergyman. And a very convincing job he did, too. A more satisfactory clergyman than the Reverend Mr. Whalen, no doubt, whose possible complicity may compel him to answer some very awkward questions. Then you're not married. Well, <laughs> upon my soul, Holmes, I, I, I don't know what to say. Then I suggest that you say nothing, my dear chap. Let's just sit back quietly, as two good friends can, and brood about the uh, mutability of human affairs. Well, Doctor, tonight's adventure was really a little extraordinary, to say the least. Holmes sure had a narrow escape. A uh, doubly narrow, Mr. Foreman, doubly narrow. He not only escaped the, the jaws of death, but he also escaped the... The clutches of matrimony. Actually, the story had a happy ending for everybody but Lady Venering. Uh, uh, Jasmine Lafleur. What about that artist fellow, McComas? How did he take it? Oh, very well. Very well indeed. In fact, in gratitude, he even painted Holmes's portrait. Not exactly a good likeness, though. One of those modern artists who paints his impressions of a person 
rather than a portrait. What do you mean? Well, now, let me see. If he were to paint his impression of you, you'd probably end up by looking like a bottle of Petri wine in a sports jacket. Go ahead, Doctor. You can tease me all you want, but I'll still rave about Petri wine. And why not? The facts bear me out that Petri wine most certainly is good wine. After all, the Petri family knows all there is to know about the art of turning plump, sun-ripened grapes into fragrant, delicious wine. That's because they've been making wine for generations, ever since they started the Petri business way back in the 1800s. And because the making of Petri wine is a family affair, the family has been able to hand down from father to son, from father to son, all their skill and knowledge and experience. And believe me, that adds up to plenty. So no matter what type of wine you prefer, one to serve with meals or a wine for any special occasion, choose one of the fine Petri wines. You can't miss because Petri took time to bring you good wine. And now, Dr. Watton, what story do you have lined up for us next week? Well, now, let me see, Mr. Foreman. I'm going to tell you about, uh, about a strange adventure that began by my taking a wild cab ride through the moonlit streets of London and ended Holmes and me being trapped in a luxuriously furnished cellar below a furniture warehouse down by the waterfront. <laughs> Tonight's Sherlock Holmes adventure is written by Dennis Green and Anthony Boucher and is based on an incident in the Sir Arthur Conan Doyle story, The Adventure of Shoskin Old Place. Mr. Rathbone appears through the courtesy of Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer and Mr. Bruce through the courtesy of Universal Pictures, where they are now starring in the Sherlock Holmes series. The Petri Wine Company of San Francisco, California, invites you to tune in again next week, same time, same station. Oh, the Petri family took the time to bring you such good wine. So when you eat and when you cook, remember Petri wine. To make good food taste better, remember... Pet, pet, Petri. This is Bill Foreman saying goodnight for the Petri family. Sherlock Holmes comes to you from our Hollywood studios. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. Welcome back. Uh, the book of Tobit, if you, are, if you are a Protestant, that may sound a little unfamiliar to you. Because most, uh, most Protestant sects uh, put the book of Tobit as an apocryphal work. Um, uh, and so it's not considered to be in the Old Testament like the story said. Um, uh, rather, uh, this is in the Orthodox and Catholic uh, Catholic uh, canons, uh, much more so than in uh, various Protestant sects. This story was unique because it took uh, uh, the story in a direction that perhaps Arthur Conan Doyle might not have ever imagined. But it was kind of fun to hear some of these lines delivered. I, I think everybody listening knows enough about Holmes uh, and enough about the fact that the Doyle family would sue if somebody were to try and have the character get married, that we know uh, there's not going to be a, an actual marriage. But some of the lines uh, were, were great to hear. Uh, it was a, a, very, uh, a very interesting story, and I think a good preview of what we've got ahead of us. And I got to say, though, uh, the folks at Petri, they did a good job. These are these are some uh, classy, well done uh, product placements that uh, they put in here. Also, I, th I think we hear here that this mutual series um, was uh, was broadcast live uh, before a live audience, as they uh, as they said it was in the studio, and you hear the applause. Um, indicates that they were doing this before an audience, and of course, uh, we got the uh, we got the note from Michael uh, uh, a few weeks back, and he mentioned that his uh, father had gone to see Rathbone and Bruce uh, do uh, Sherlock Holmes. They'd come out to do it for the troops. Uh, so, so that would be a great ticket. I would love to see those two acting acting this out. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, bringing you this week's episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar. Got any comments? Send them to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. 
please cast your vote for the show on Podcast Alley at podcastalley.greatdetectives.net. And please uh, become part of our Facebook page, facebook.greatdetectives.net. A reminder that tomorrow we're going to have Sherlock Holmes and the Secret Weapon. Now, for those of you, uh, just so you're prepared, if you've never seen one of the Rathbone Bruce uh, Universal uh, Sherlock Holmes movies, this is set in what would be considered modern times in the 1940s. Um, and there's reasons for that, and that'll all be discussed on the uh, commentary uh, that goes if you've got the app, app.greatdetectives.net. All right, well, we have got some email, and we've got some comments on Podcast Alley, as well as review. We'll get to it all in due course. We begin with an email from uh, Sparky, who emails in, I first listened to Old Tom Radio in 1959 on Misawa Air Force Base, Japan, when we were stationed there. They had some canned TV and lots of canned radio. I had my first transistor radio. I remember yours truly, Johnny Dollar, but it seems like the episodes were only 15 minutes long. Um, those must have been reruns from the 1955 to 56 uh, season. Those were 15-minute serials that uh, done five times a week, um, and we're gonna. And those those are at, were some very fine episodes. Uh, some of the absolute best uh, radio drama um, from what, you know, uh, from, in, you know, even just beyond detective shows. And we'll be, we'll do something a little special when it comes to playing those. Uh, but he goes ahead and said, I really appreciate my exposure then to all those dramas, detectives, scaries, comedies, and westerns, a wonderful rich part of American culture. I live in San Diego. We used to have access to the drama hour on KNX 1070 in LA until they passed that on to a weaker station. Unfortunately, in late 2003, the management of KNX changed and they dropped the drama hour after nearly 30 years of nightly show. So I'm delighted to have this podcast. Thanks very much. Well, thank you for listening. Yeah, a lot of radio stations do seem to have discontinued doing uh, old-time radio. A lot of them had shoved them out to late at night when a lot of people just couldn't listen. I know that our local station discontinued it, um, their old-time radio show, several years back to air coast-to-coast -to -coast AM, which is kind of UFO conspiracy type thing. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the podcast makes it more viable because it works around when people can actually listen to it. All right, we'll save the rest of these until after the show. Um, before we get into today's episode, I want to encourage you, uh, as you make your travel plans, whether you're flying to Hawaii or taking a cruise around the world, Okay, that might be a little extravagant. But whatever you might happen to be doing, please remember uh, johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com uh, for all of your uh, travel needs. Uh, it goes to priceline.com where you get great deals where you're able to name your own price and search for uh, great deals. Uh, just remember johnnydollarair.com and help support uh, the great detectives of old time radio. Well, we're going to get into today's uh, episode of Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, The Search for Michelle March, and then we'll be back for some nice post-show commentary. Sure, they may have plenty of blue blood in Boston, but from what I just saw, they've got plenty of the other kind, too. <laughs> This is another in the adventures of America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, Johnny Dollar. At insurance investigation, Johnny Dollar is only an expert. At making out his expense account, he is an absolute genius. <laughs> expense account submitted by special investigator Johnny Dollar. To home office... Tri-State Life and Casualty Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of my expenditures during my search for your missing policyholder, Miss Michelle March. Or, she came in like a lion and went out on the lamb. Or, she should have been banned in Boston. 
That's a count, item one. Two dollars and eighty-five cents. Railroad transportation, Hartford to Boston. Expense account item two, a dollar eighty. Cab fare to the corner of Longwood and Huntington Avenue. A half block from the apartment house that was Miss March's last known address. Boston may be called the cradle of liberty, but somebody else got rocked to sleep that morning on Longwood. <laughs> the shot came from two carbines and two men in one light tan club coupe parked across the street. I waited long enough to memorize the license number as the pot rotted out of there, and then I headed for the victim. My heart was pounding, but not from exercise. He'd been sprayed coming out of a doorway that, in another 20 seconds, I would have been going in. <laughs> But the coincidence didn't stop there. Take it easy now, will you? We'll get you some help. You know who did it? I don't know. Mark. What? I didn't get you. Tell him. Tell him. Tell him. Mark. Michelle March? Well, that's who I'm looking for. What's she got to do with it? Can you hear me? What's Michelle March got to do with it? Come on now. Cry. I wonder if I should have stayed in hot. Why didn't you help me like you had it? Like the shooting gallery, I was inside the shop and brought her out where I stayed. Hey, Mr. Howard, do you see me tell? Yeah. Let's just say you don't need to stand back to give him air. He can't use it. While the two limelight happy carriages from the crowd argued about who was going to notify the police, I disappeared from the scene by way of that death doorway. Pausing inside just long enough to learn from the buzzer panel that Michelle March's apartment number was, unluckily, 213. I didn't bother to look for the apartment house manager. I didn't even bother to pick the lock. I put my shoulder to work on the door. search, but it didn't offer anything to find. The only thing even faintly resembling a lead I found on the floor behind the bureau, a book of matches that advertised Boston's best bar by far, Flannery, with an address on Washington Street. Just about then I decided that rather than being found at the scene of breaking and entering, I'd look up the police at the scene of murder. <laughs> He was shot from across the street by two men in a fan club troop. Probably stolen. License number, Massachusetts, 3R165. Weapons were carbines, 30 caliber on the issue. Hmm. You sure of all that? Yeah. Here. This will tell you why I make it a habit to be sure of things. Oh. Dollar. Insurance investigator. Uh-huh. Hartford. Well, in a way, that makes two of you. Huh? I'm Lieutenant Valdeller. By the major. The dead man was a local detective. Private license, good business. And a bad reputation. Name of? Uh-uh. Something I can't pass off right now. Oh, look, here's why I'm interested, Lieutenant. If one detective was on a case, he could have been hired to find the same party I was hired to find. And since he was blasted at said party's last known address, it could be that somebody doesn't want said party found. Which paints an interesting but uh, gloomy picture of my future. Who is this said party? A girl, Michelle March, reported a missing persons in New York yesterday by a worried sister, who is also the beneficiary of a $25,000 insurance policy owned by Miss March. The insurer's Tri-State Life got the report from missing persons and hired me to find her. You think she's dead? I'll tell you when I find her. Yeah. Now, uh, what makes you think the deceased might have been looking for her, too? Because he mentioned her name just before he went bye-bye. What are you saying, Dolly? Uh, just in case we need you. Cartwright Hotel. Now, look, Lieutenant. You've got a murder and I've got a missing person. You can loaf if you want to, but I'm eager. I want to talk to the apartment house manager. Any objections? No. Go right ahead, Dolly. Good luck to you. I can tell you how upset I am over this, Mr. Dolly. 
I've managed to run the houses for over 30 years and lost them some very nice ones. <laughs> this is the first murder I've ever had. Oh, why did Pace point at me? Pace didn't point, Mrs. Macy. The gentleman was knocked off because he was involved with one of your tenants. Oh! Oh, that's impossible. I've tried so hard. References, my own personal observation. Oh, I'm glad to hear that, Mrs. Macy. In fact, the more personal your observations were, the gladder I'll be. Well, it isn't that I snooped, Mr. Dahl. Of course not, Mrs. Macy. <laughs> Who was it? Michelle March, 213. Oh, she's a lovely girl. But her habits were quite irregular. Often came in late. Oh. I understand she hasn't been staying in her apartment for the past two weeks. You know where she went? I know, but I, I did happen to be just outside her door when she came out with a suitcase and her gentleman caller, her employer, I believe she said. Something about some work they had to do in the country. Uh-huh. Did you leave a forwarding address? She had little reason to do that. Why, all the time she's been here, the only letter she's gotten is from somebody in Chicago. One a month. A man, I'd say, from the penmanship. Did I get one this month, though? Do you, uh, by any chance, remember what those letters said? Oh, you young upstart. I'm only trying to help. I know, Mrs. Macy. You're a lovable old gossip. After Mrs. Macy chased me out of her apartment, I questioned some of Michelle's second-floor neighbors. What they gave me only augmented the story I already had. She hadn't been seen in the company of anyone for four or five months. Until Dapper, Medium Bill, and Swarthy took over. All of them had seen him. None of them knew his name. But they all agreed he was the guy Michelle March had marched away with. Everything I learned added up to a dame getting tired of waiting for somebody in Chicago and ducking out with somebody else. It would have looked that simple if it hadn't been for that detective who had so recently taken up new headquarters in the city morgue. <laughs> Expense account, item three, $4.75, drink and dinner. After which, expense account, item four, one eighty, taxi ride. Taken on the strength of the weak clue I found on Michelle's apartment floor. The match folder from Boston's best bar by far. Flannery. Flannery's look like they wouldn't want to know how old you are, but how many stretches and in what prison. Above a row of greasy bottles, the wall behind the bar was covered with pictures of fighters. Right from old John L. up to Rocky Graziano. But none of them looked as brutal as the eight or ten gorillas who had their feet on the brass rail. I decided this was no place to ask for a lady. So I asked for a drink. Yeah. A straight rye. Double. You've never been in before. Where are you from? I'm trying to forget. Has, um, Blackie been around lately? Who's Blackie? Well, maybe that's not his full name. It's the one I knew him by. Uh, he wore a lot of sharp suits, you know, about medium build, dark, swarthy. That could be anybody. Now, drink your drink, pay for it, and move along. Now, wait a minute. Now, I haven't got anything against the guy. I'm looking for a dame that's with him, see? What's the freeze for? I need the room. Expecting a private crowd. Now beat it. Climb off, Flannery. Uh, Maybe I want to talk to these guys. I did it, Flannery. Yeah, look, no, I did it. I'll get closed up again if I get any more trouble this week. Take them outside, Roxy. Huh? Shut up. What's this Niles name you're looking for? Michelle March. You know her? Yeah. Let's go someplace and talk. Thanks for the invitation, but... Let go of the arm. You get gangrene when the circulation is cut off. Sorry. Come on. What makes you so upset about the lost Michelle? What do you want with Louis Marine? Louis Marine? If he's the guy she's with, all I want him to do is to point her out. You and me might get along with that. It'd be worth plenty to... Look out! Get this guy! Hey! Hey! Oh. The car they were in was different, but those carbines sounded the same. I rubbed my nose raw, trying to bury my head in that sidewalk. I knew they had to empty those carbines sometime, but instead of sounding better, it started to sound worse. I twisted my head, shot a look at the street, saw one of the attackers in the process of falling out of one of the windows with a gun car. Closed my eyes again and realized why they never let my kind of insurance investigator be a policyholder. 
I've been sent to find a missing girl, and there I was in the middle of another Boston massacre. Listening to Yours Truly, Johnny Dollar, starring Charles Russell. It took a full 20 seconds after the smoke of battle had started to clear for me to realize that I'd been saved by the arrival of fire support from an unexpected source the police. I looked around for my new friend and brother target, Rocky, but he had disappeared. A wave of suspicion broke over my flow of thought with this question. How did it happen that all those cops with all those guns just happened to be in all those hiding places waiting for those gunmen to drive up and open up? Answer? A hunter's stew like that usually calls for a pigeon. I didn't feel like flying, but I did. Straight back to my hotel. With one landing and a newsstand. An evening paper gave me everything else I needed, except the feathers. But I wasn't exactly cooing when I got to my hotel room phone and put a call through to the Boston police. South Precinct, Sergeant Miller. Give me Lieutenant Bell in homicide. One moment. Dollar, Lieutenant. Uh, oh, oh, Dollar, sure. I'm glad to hear from you. I'll have your badge for this. What? What did you say? The evening paper. Quote, Boston private detective, whose name has been withheld by police, was slain today, presumably to stop his search for a missing girl. It was learned by this paper from reliable sources. Oh, now, Dollar. That another investigator still alive has joined the hunt for the girl. Well, I... Johnny Dollar, well-known Hartford insurance sleuth, checked in the room 705 at the Cartwright Hotel today. Well, you want more? Why, I, I can't understand it. I, I told the boys not to say a word. I think the boys didn't. Oh, now, see here, a man would have to do pretty low to use methods like that. You'll probably touch your toes every morning for practice. Well, I hope you got the results of your stake out in front of Flannery's. You got two hot car beans and a hot car. The evidence that could have talked, those gunmen, are so full of police lead that your only chance of learning anything now is to find somebody strong enough to pick them up and write with them. Now, wait a minute. You know who hired them? Well, I'll find out. Uh, when you get confused, check with me. I think I know. Now, do I get the name of that private detective? The deceased? Well, I don't see any harm. Uh, Bernard Knight. Hired by? Uh, well, all right, Dollar. If you'll cooperate, I will. And according to his files, he was hired by uh, Roxy Morris to find the girl. Now, who hired the gunman? I think, but don't know that they were hired by a gent named Louis Marie. To stop Rocky Morris from finding Michelle March. Why? We'll have more about that later. But if you'll put a search on that pair of names, I'll look for a good night's sleep. And after that sidewalk, it was easy to find. Morris will follow me. How do you know about Roxy? Would he like to find you and Louis Marine? What did he tell you? Oh, what counts is that I filled in what he didn't tell me. Namely, that he was in Chicago for a year, and you were supposed to be waiting for him in this fatal apartment on Longwood Avenue. But instead, Louis Marine landed, took the situation well in hand, and captured you for himself. You're just trying to sound surprised, aren't you? If it fits, keep it on approval. Uh, the point is, there are too many people looking for you to stay lost. Where can I meet you? How do I know I can trust you? I can't trust anybody. Look, 
I'm still working for the insurance company, so my greatest interest is keeping you alive, not selling you out. What about the police? Well, my promise is not equipped with lifetime guarantees, but I'll do what I can. If you tell all, and if the story is big enough, they should be willing to make a deal. It's big, all right. You'll clear something out of that book that's been there for a year. Where do I meet you? You know where Charlestown is? Well, I know it's part of Boston. Take the subway and get off at City Square. An hour from now. I'll be in a bar. The gangplank. On Chelsea Street. Near the Navy Yard. Okay, sweetie. I'll be there. Up until now, whoever's been doing the shooting has used everything but battleships. Even though Michelle's story sounded like trap bait, cheesy indeed, I had to take a chance. I dove into a cab and had the cab drive into the top of Hanover Street and down to Boston's North End. Playing quiz games with strangers in that section is called Take It or Lump It. But a few well-placed 20s led me to a neighborhood undertaker who had the officially unproved reputation of creating a large demand for his own services. We swapped donations. I gave him 50 bucks, and he gave me a large out of the corner of his mouth hole. Uh, listen to me good. About a year ago, the laws picked up a Roxy Morris on a suspicion. They had a good idea. He's a heist of the 75 G payroll. But there were no weaknesses. He didn't leave none. Roxy knew they'd watch him. So he hightailed it out of town. Mm -hmm. But he didn't detect the loot with him. The boys around the year got it back on the grapevine. He was uh, suffering from the shorts. So everybody figured he had the dough uh, stashed away uh, somewhere right around the year. Is that all? Have you got anything else to tell me? Yeah. Goodbye. I didn't like the way that undertaker said Goodbye. <laughs> I legged it up to the subway station, marked Union, went down in and caught a train for Charlestown. Once the city square, a three-block walk down Chelsea Street, produced the gangplank bar, which, in turn, produced that nose-bruising smell which comes from slopping beer on sawdust. Out of place in the place sat Michelle March. She was a good looker, with a bad look. And if I had been Roxy Morris, I would have elected her the last national bank. I popped into a booth beside her. She turned her head my way, looked me straight in the kitchen, blew a smoke ring at me, and popped two words through it. You dollar? Yep, I'm dollar. You march? I'm Michelle March. Well, so far so good. It's nice hearing you breathe. That means Tri-State Insurance can keep its nice $25,000. Only if you keep me this way, Mr. Dollar. And that might prove to be a difficult thing to do. Oh, maybe not so difficult. Why not? Well, you indicated yourself that your magnetic personality might suddenly attract a few steel jacket bullets. That means there'll have to be somebody to pull the trigger. So all I have to do is to sit around and see who tries to take a shot at the target. You, and we've got our man. It's not that easy. I'm in trouble three ways. And it's hard to see three ways at once. Look, I know all about Roxy Morris. He swiped $75,000 and gave it to you to mine. You don't know the half of it. Two months after Roxy was gone, a guy named Louis Marine came to me with a story that Roxy had sent for $20,000. I gave it to him. Then he told me that Roxy had never sent for him. And that if I squawked, he'd convince Roxy that I'd fallen in love with him and just given him the money. He did that or he'd tip off the police. He had me going and coming. Nice fellow. He wouldn't leave me alone. He made me give him 15000 more of Roxy's money. Then two weeks ago, I got word through to Roxy in Chicago. He blew up. Turned on me. I've been running from him ever since. He wanted 75000 all of it. And I haven't got it. Oh, seems like you've been taking chances all the way. Now, you know what I want you to do? No, what? Take one more. I told Michelle what I had in mind for her, during the next few hours at least, and grabbed a cab back across the bridge into the north end. Expense account item five, fifty dollars Another donation to my expensive undertaker. This time I paid him for talking, but not to me. Then I took over the telephone and dialed my way through to the guy to whom I was about to give a chance of becoming the ding dong daddy of the Boston Police Force, Lieutenant Bell. Yes, Dollar, this is Lieutenant Bell. Bell, how would you like to get the goods on Roxy Mars? Well, I'd like it fine. Okay. And along with that, how'd you like to pin a receiving stolen property wrap on Louis Marine? I hope you aren't just being sorry, Dollar. I'm not, Lieutenant. Now, look, 
uh, you may have to do some trading with a gal on this deal. Yeah. You may have to promise her some time off for verbal good behavior. Well, such things are possible. All right, what's the pitch? Listen, I have baited a tall, thin granite trap for Roxy Morris and Louis Marine. The bait is Roxy's ex-girlfriend, Michelle March. Okay. What's that? I had a tip to call Roxy Morris and tell her that Louis Marine was meeting Michelle at a certain place at 3 o'clock this afternoon. Yeah, yeah. I also had Mr. Blabbermouth call Louis Marine and tell him that Michelle is meeting Roxy at the same time and the same place. What? I had him tell each of the gentlemen that Michelle was meeting the other one with what's left of the money in cash. Oh, you started a war, Dollar. Oh, but if it does, the trick is worth it. All right, all right. Uh, what's my move? First, call the, call the place where I've arranged a surprise party and uh, tell them to get rid of the public. But, uh, also tell them to let a girl named Michelle March come and go as she pleases. Also me. Oh, don't tell me you've set this thing up in a public place. Where is it? Lieutenant Bell. Yes. What I want is for those two characters to run up a blind alley. And when I say up, oh, brother, they got the word that Michelle meeting would be held at the top of the Bunker Hill Monument. Oh, no. And you might remember what General, General Prescott almost said. Don't fire till you see the red in their eyes. I was back in Charlestown and at the base of the Bunker Hill Monument at a quarter to three. The door of the museum at the bottom was open, but a state park officer stood by its side. I told him who I was, and he nodded me through the bronze doors. Uh, officer, did uh, Miss March get here? Yes, sir, young man. She went up the shaft. Oh, uh, well, look, can I run the elevator myself? I'll get a steady elevator. Just step two to three hundred. Oh. Ow, oh, this may be going to heaven the hard way, but here goes. Halfway up the winding granite stairs, I yelled for Michelle. But she either didn't hear me or just didn't want to answer. I kept going and hoping. As I came closer to the top, I tried yelling again. Still no answer. Finally, I made it. Up into the observation landing at the top. Michelle was there. She still wouldn't talk, but she had written me a note. Beside her crumpled figure was a vial that hadn't been filled with perfume. The note was short and to the point. Dear Johnny Dollar, I still want to help, but I hadn't better be around here alive when everybody gets here. And it was time Michelle... I bent over to see what kind of bye bye medicine she'd taken. I heard something that might mean a sudden dose of lead to the head for me. By the Morris or Marine had landed, and then I was stuck at the top with a bait that had sucked them into a trap, which suddenly turned out to be mine. Waiting up there in that tiny room for death to come get me would have killed me anyway, so I started down. With the pounding of my heart and my own steps on the granite blocks. I heard the pitter patter of anything but tiny feet come charging up a narrow staircase. Whoever was coming up, and I both slowed down. But my heart didn't. And I crept around a curve, and my eyes went to a head on collision with a pair staring back. What are you doing here? Uh, I'm, I'm a tourist, uh, Rocky. Maybe right, white guy. You may be taking a trip. Who's up there? Uh, oh, uh, up there? Oh. I don't know who they are, just some girl with a guy she keeps calling Louie. Okay. Let me boy. Easy now. Don't try anything. <laughs> Roxy Morris tagged me with a butt of a thirty two going by. But lying there with my head against the cold granite inside wall of the monument brought me back. And conscious was a very dangerous condition for me to be in. Because charging up the stairs came another pair of unfriendly feet that couldn't have belonged to anybody but Louis Marine. Who are you? What are you doing here? Oh, up until somebody hit me on the head, I was killing Roxy Morris and his girl. They're up there? Sure, Louis. Yeah, they're up there. And let me by. Come on. Get up out of my way. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Bye. Yeah. But wait a minute. I got ideas. Come on, chum. Ahead of me. Up you go. You can affront for me. Move! Louie had a gun at my back, and Roxy had one waiting for me up front. We took the last few steps up to the top real quiet-like. My eyes came level to the floor of the observation room. 
Roxy was bending over Michelle, but he snapped up in a hurry and his right hand was loaded with heat. Louie pushed me ahead of him, up and in. I stood there between them, listening to them grind their teeth at each other, with one foot under Michelle's arm. Then I got two big shots. A scream from Michelle, just before she snatched my legs out from under me. Hey, what are you doing alive? I don't know. I don't know. I guess I, I didn't take him up. Well, whatever you're doing alive, I'll tell you one thing. Your two boyfriends sure took care of each other. Come on. Let me get you out of here. Oh. Um, I didn't think I'd be able to carry me down all those stairs. Now I have to carry you. Spence account, item six. Twenty dollars. City hospital. Having Michelle's stomach pumped out. And the way Michelle took my suggestion that she voluntarily turn herself over to the police was very good. Lieutenant Bell was very cooperative. Otherwise, I might let it be known that the reason that he didn't show up on time to help me in the 1949 Battle of Bunker Hill was because he forgot to reset his watch at the end of daylight saving time. He showed up for our three o'clock appointment at four. Uh, expense account total. Yeah. Seven hundred and eighty-six dollars and no cents. Signed, yours, um, truly, Johnny Dollar. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is produced and directed by Gordon T. Hughes and stars Charles Russell with script by Paul Dudley and Gil Dowd. Featured in the cast were Bill Boucher, Myra Marsh, Dick Ryan, Larry Dobkin, Charles Seal, and Dorothy Lovett. The special music is written and conducted by Leif Stevens. Be sure to be with us next Saturday, October 1st, when another unusual expense account is handed in by... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. That's right. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, will be heard on Saturday evenings starting next Saturday. And look at who's going to be here at the same time on Sunday. The world's most famous blockhead, Charlie McCarthy, accompanied by a man who shadows him closely as Johnny shadows the suspect, Edgar Bergen. Yes, Charlie McCarthy and Edgar Bergen have joined the great parade of stars to CBS along with Jack Benny, Amos and Andy, Horace Hyde, and Red Skelton, whose show starts next Saturday, or rather next Sunday also. Don't miss the first hilarious appearance of Charlie and Bergen on most of these same CBS stations at the same time next Sunday night and every Sunday thereafter. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Welcome back. I, I like the, this particular episode for a number of reasons. I've heard several old-time radio shows in Boston, and usually they don't do anything uh, with the accent. Here they definitely tried to recreate it. I don't know if I totally bought it, but I could tell there was, uh, there was some effort towards that uh, Bostonian accent uh, on behalf of Miss March. The other thing is that Johnny Dollar calls attention to the private detective's best friend, the nosy landlady. Um, but overall, this this worked out pretty good. I I, ha I have to say I didn't quite get the uh, I didn't quite get why she was committing suicide up there. They I don't think they really um, established her mo motive. Uh, well, uh, well enough for wanting to do that, but uh, overall, the, I, I think this worked very well, and it's nice to see uh, this major uh, scene happen at a at a at a big historical monument. All right, well, uh, we got a few more comments on the show and some miscellaneous thing. This question comes on the Facebook page from David, who writes, Love the podcast. Please keep them. Any chance of posting an old British show called uh, Dick Barton? Uh, many thanks. Um, 
the answer to the question regarding shows that are specifically um, fo- uh, foreign with no real U.S. airing, uh, can't actually do those. Um, now, there are some shows uh, that were syndicated between the U.S. and Britain. That, that's probably a little different. But those shows that were actually specifically made in Britain and not... Um, or any other foreign country, I generally, as a rule, don't uh, do, uh, just because the United States passed a very confusing law. And the basis of the law is that um, is that the shows have to be um, in uh, the public domain, but they have to have been in the public domain back in 1996. So in other words, to actually figure out if the shows were okay to post, I would have to be knowledgeable in the country's copyright laws. I did research a little bit on Dick Barton and the British copyright laws. Um, And basically, uh, what I came up with is the original Dick Barton show from the 1940s would probably be okay to play because they didn't uh, copyright radio broadcast until 19. Uh, until the 1950s. Um, But the only thing that's out there is the Dick Barton uh, radio show from the 1970s. And that would not be okay um, because in Britain there's a 50-year copyright. So um, that one would have still been uh, under copyright in 1996 and will come out of copyright in Britain in 2022. It will come out of copyright in the United States in 2067. So I don't, I don't know if I'll be doing the podcast uh, that long. But, yeah, uh, as a general rule, can't even uh, go near the, for, uh, the, the foreign shows um, because it's so hard to figure out whether they are really legal to play. But there are some cases in regards to some movies uh, that are making their way through the U.S. federal courts, um, and that could change. But for now, no, can't do any of the foreign shows. We got a review on iTunes for the first time in actually about three months. So this is from Snazzy DJ Cat. Love that username. Um, I've enjoyed Adam's Dragnet podcast and was excited to hear he was starting another. The Great Detectives is well great. He has a good mix of awesome shows, regular episodes, and overall excellent production quality. This is one of my favorite podcasts. Well, thanks for the uh, review, and and just uh, keep on listening. This one comes from Andrew in Richmond. I came to these after listening to a number of the Dragnet podcasts. I think they complement one another. The arrangement of shows is very good, too. They would not be as enjoyable if they were all higgly-piggly. As with Dragnet, Adam's comments add to the shows. I agree with others. I feel like I'm listening to a friend give me insights into the different episodes. Thank you, Adam. And thanks so much. Uh, and that one comes from Richmond, Virginia. And, uh, again, that was one of the, the reasons um, I started the show, because I saw all the detective podcasts, for the most part, were uh, either out of sequence um, in terms of the episodes or just different detectives. Uh, And then a comment from Natalie, I don't know why you do it, but thanks. Well, thanks, Natalie. We do it, well, mainly because we uh, enjoy the shows. And also, um, other people enjoy them. That really adds a value to it. Um, and it's and it's something when you're able to bring these um, and uh, if it, it, it meets a need, it, it really uh, provides a, a definite purpose there. So, all right. Well, we've got actually I got an email uh, regarding a picture on the website. Eileen emails. I've been a longtime fan. Love your commentary on all the shows. This is the first time I saw your photo. If I had to guess by the sound of your voice, I thought you were much older. Maybe it's time to either update the microphone or the picture. Well, the microphone's fine. The picture isn't all that old. It's it's actually was about uh, maybe a year and a half old. I uh, took it for the local paper for a... Uh, editorial where they specifically requested the picture, and then they didn't run the uh, editorial. But another story. Um, but yeah, that's pretty pretty much about it. A little bit a little bit older. I'm pushing thirty. 
So that's uh, that's how old. So. All right, well, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Got any comments? Send them to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. Uh, podcast alley.greatdetectives.net is where you can cast your vote for the show. And uh, from Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off. And we'll see you on Saturday with Sherlock Holmes and the Secret Weapon. <laughs>